All right, Christian. Thanks for uh, thanks for swinging by. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Are you fresh in from Europe? You mentioned you were traveling through Europe uh, recently. Yes, exactly. I uh, came back about ten days ago, okay. maybe not even, and I'm flying again Friday. Oh wow, busy. Yeah. So busy, but it's really because of my wife. Uh, my wife is working in London, so I'm kind of going back and forth while she's there for like almost a year. That's a small commute. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, but you're originally from Germany, right? Originally, I'm from Germany. My parents are Czech. Okay. Uh, so I grew up in Germany um, with my wife, actually. We grew up uh, next to each other. Oh, really? But Like childhood friends? Childhood, yeah. We know each other since we're like nine. Oh, wow. Um, but um, my parents are Czech, so I grew up Czech in Germany. Like at home, we were speaking Czech, you know, kind of Czech culture, which mm -hmm. is a little different. So so you were an immigrant into Germany. So yes. did you get treated different than just being like a German? I think because I was born there, not so much. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, because of the name a little bit. My last name is Czech, but like not really. Not not like my wife. No. You know, she immigrated when she was seven okay. from Iran. Oh, wow. So she didn't speak the language. So that was a little harder for sure. Yeah, yeah. for sure. That is much more difficult. Yeah. Wow. So, so, I mean... I've been wanting to chat with you for a while because, uh, you know, it's not often you get to talk to a professional athlete, former or current, uh, and then someone who's kind of finished their professional sporting career and then gone into coaching professional athletes. Mm -hmm. And I know you have this whole, um, like, system about about uh, mental training and, and this kind of thing. So we'll get into all of it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, but, but 2024 has been going well for you so far? Um, I mean, it's March. <laughs> yeah, it's still early, right? It is. And so far, it's been very, very good. Mm -hmm. 2023 has been a little bit of a rougher patch. Yeah. Um, but also, like, physically, mostly. I was, like, sick and injured for basically all 2023. Oh, my God, that's tough. First time in my life where I was, like, just health was not, like, at the level where I was kind of used to. Not regular injuries, so that was a little challenging. Okay. But, um, you know, my company is going better and better, and I love teaching what I'm teaching, and my wife is doing great, and family is healthy. So at the moment, uh, everything is wonderful and enjoying every moment until it isn't, and then handle that. Yes, exactly. So this is a good philosophy for life. Just keep going yes. until you hit the wall. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, okay, so you mentioned you were born in the Czech Republic. So, like, no, uh, my parents are, your I parents were yeah, Czech. Flat, and I was uh, born in Germany, like, just when they had fled. Like, they were in Germany for, like, a year, maybe. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. So, your 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 family fled the Czech, Czechoslovakia. Back then, it was Czechoslovakia. Exactly. Um, And then... And then you were kind of born in, into into Germany. What where was that? Like early eighties? Yep. Eighty one. Yeah, Eighty one. Okay. I'm just a little bit older than you. I'm late seventies. Yeah. Yeah. Seventy eight. Seventy eight. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but uh, but what was it like? Do you remember anything about like having to leave your home? Um, you mean like fleeing the Czech? I mean, so you were born in Germany. Born in Germany. I was born in Germany. Do your parents tell stories about having to fly? Yes. I have two sisters. Uh, they are uh, six years older than me. Mm -hmm. um, so when my parents fled Czechoslovakia, communism back then yeah. right, um, was kind of a little rough. I uh, believe, when yeah. you were somewhat successful professionally, you basically were forced to join the Communist Party or you would be imprisoned. It was like, you know, not everybody other. had to join the party, but if you reached a certain a societal status you had to um, and that happened with my parents my dad was basically the uh, um, becoming the head of the clinic in Prague like a medical ENT. clinic yeah, yeah. An ENT he mm -hmm. just turned 80 oh. congratulations uh, that's no small feat yeah exactly. and great everything is good mm -hmm. um, and my mother was a newscaster oh really one of okay. three channels or whatever it was back then yeah. you know like one of five people so um, and then in order to escape the Communist Party from in Prague, they first moved to another city, to a really small town, and kind of gave up their life in Prague um, to do what they did, but not be part of the party. Uh, and to that, create some distance. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but okay. then in that city, which was a really tiny town, 
the Communist Party came again. Oh. Um, and then my dad was like, I can't, I can't do this. I will, uh, I will die before I uh, join the party. Uh, and so they fled, which was kind of, that was in 79 or end of 79. Um, and most of my uh, parents' friends, they basically fled in 68 and 69. Oh, right. so your family stayed 10 years longer because there was the Prague uh, uprising, right? Yeah. And uh, my dad wanted to flee, but his mom kind of went crazy and didn't let him or convinced him not to, mm. which resulted in me now being here because otherwise my parents wouldn't have met. <laughs> of course, yeah. Good news, good news. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so a little bit later they went and then they went to via Austria to Germany to one of his old friends and then started from scratch. Yeah. That's amazing. I tell you, like, the stories of people who got out of like Eastern European commun communism and into Western Europe, none of these stories are boring and all of them are kind of yes. heartbreaking because people have to like give up everything and start from scratch in their 30s or 40s with nothing. Nothing. I feel like... Language, no, no money. Yeah. Uh, they had absolutely no money. They had a daughter and uh, my dad was forced to redo his specialty. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't accept it. Of course. Uh, and my mom uh, started helping out in the hospital uh, with the elderly and cleaning, um, you know, the elderly and moving them, stuff like that. And Very different from being a newscaster. Yeah. You know, very fresh, yeah. kind of whatever was possible. I feel like the older generations are much tougher than we are. Yeah, uh, for sure, for some. I mean, I feel like the it's just too convenient nowadays. Yeah. Everything is, yeah, that's a whole... Everything's everything's getting <laughs> easier, and uh, but obviously, you know, people are still migrating, and especially in this country, right? There's people coming across the the border looking for new lives and things like that. So that we have modern day versions of of this, but it's um it's amazing, kind of what the older generations went through. Yeah. So when did you pick up a tennis racket? Um, four. Yep. Um, I think I was four. Okay. So My dad was a good uh, athlete also before he was a doctor. He played volleyball and he was world champion, actually. Yeah, because you're quite tall. How tall uh, are you? Yeah, like six. Three. Yeah, okay. I'm a little less shorter than you, yeah. maybe, but. Like good tennis height. Good shape. <laughs> the perfect <laughs> tennis height. Not too big, not too small. Even though nowadays there's a few guys that are taller and still move very well. Yeah. Just like... What's the. Um, who's the Russian guy who's just huge? Um, Medvedev. Medvedev. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, he's a, he's a monster. I used to live in. Uh, I lived in Shanghai. I used to go to the Shanghai um, tournament every year. My friend used to actually host it. And then uh, and then I was in Dubai and Abu Dhabi for the last few years, and I would always see uh, the pro players coming through in, like, December on their way out to Melbourne for the Australian Open. They'd come to play in Abu Dhabi, Dabu Dai, and then they or Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and then they'd go out to uh, Australia for the Australian Open. Yeah. So I watched a lot of tennis, actually, in the last couple of years. Since COVID, it's been great. Um, I played... I played way, way back in the day, but you know what? I was a ball boy. My mom, my mom was working the um, the uh, uh, ticket taker. She was a ticket taker at the front entrance of the Canadian Open in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And you know, it flips between men and women every year. So she was working there all summer, and then she got us in as ball boys. Mm -hmm. So my brother and I were ball boys for like ten years at the Canadian Open, and this was like McEnroe, Sampras, Agassi, Yvonne Lendl. Um, this was a, a great, a great group for the women. It was like Sabatini, the end of Martina Navratilova's career. Um, who else did we, um, Monica Seles, mm -hmm. like this was this era, Gabrielle Sabatini, Sabatini. So this was kind of, yeah, nineties, like mm -hmm. I was deep in nineties tennis and then kind of, and then gave it up. And this is where everybody was kind of into tennis. <laughs> yeah. Like it was, it's good. Type. It's coming back though. I think, I think, you know. I think the Sampras, or sorry, uh, Federer and Nadal and Djokovic have made tennis maybe a little bit boring for the last 20 years. I mean, playing at an incredibly high level, but they always win, right? Mm -hmm. There's So it's hard. <laughs> and now it's... Wins Serena also, like the, the four of them. Yeah, complete domination. Yeah. And now it's kind of now it's kind of nice to see some competition again. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I mean, I started watching this Netflix series... Um, mm -hmm. What is it called? Uh, Breakpoint. Where, yes, yeah. Yes. Where it talks a lot about the younger players, which I love. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So, so your dad was a good athlete. You picked up a tennis racket in Germany at four. And what were the early days like of, of your sporting career? Early days, you know, I were, actually it was funny. I just uh, came home for the first time after 13 years, uh, just when I was back visiting my wife also in London. So I, because my dad turned 80, so I kind of uh, went home to my hometown. Which, which is where in Germany? Uh, Bad Hersfeld. Where is that? Oh, that's the dead center of Germany. <laughs> it was where Amazon uh, created their very first uh, like depot for delivering everything from Germany because it's right in the center. It's their fulfillment center. Yeah, yeah. So, and it was right next to where I used to live. Actually, it was pretty funny. No, like, back bad. in the day, Amazon. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Germany. So I, I used to work with BMW. Okay. Um, so I was in Munich a lot. I did some uh, I did some TV shows with BMW Motorrad, which was a lot of fun. And then now I'm a watch ambassador for Glauschuta Original, okay. which is um, which is obviously based in North yeah. Eastern uh, Germany. Uh, what? Yeah, it was very nice. Glass. Yeah, gla- I never pronounce it right. Can we say it one more time? I love it. Uh, Glashütte. Yeah, Glashütte. Um, but yeah, no, um, amazing people to work with. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. it's been a wild ride. So, so you grew up in dead in the center of Germany. Dead, dead center of Germany. Four years old. Uh, basically, I started playing because. Like my parents played a little bit, you know, my dad started playing a good athlete. So they're having fun a little bit, take their little kid mm-hmm. with them. You know, I'm standing on the side and then I get a tennis lesson from the local tennis coach there. Yeah. Um, and then was, you know, somewhat talented physically, was able to pick it up a little quicker, enjoyed it. Um, so by the time I was um, seven, I think I played my first tournament. Yeah. Um, and... And one, ba- and then it's like you know you have like the uh, the city championships, and then like the county champion, provincial championships, and yeah. stuff like that. So like I won the city, and then I won the county and the province and stuff like that. And that goes pretty fast, at like at that age. Mm-hmm. Uh, so by the time I was nine or so, I was like in the squad of the state, like the California, you know, like one of the top two or top three. Yeah. There was like one guy who was like a million times better than everybody else. Was that Tommy Haas? No, he's a, your age, 78. Yeah, Tommy Haas is my, you know, I met him, I met, I was at Oktoberfest mm-hmm. in October in Munich and you can't with Tommy Haas, with Tommy Haas, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were sitting together at a table, we were with a big group of people. Really nice guy, yeah. 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 He's busy now with Indian Wells. Yeah, he's busy, he's busy all the time. He's yeah. doing training and camps yeah. and everything and he was already, uh, he moved to uh, the Nick Bollettieri Tennis Academy when he was like in his early teens. Oh, so he didn't even really no. grow up in Florida or in the Germany. He yeah. didn't spend much time in Germany. Okay. You know, sometime, but like not, you know, I don't know, maybe when he was 14 or 12 or something. He had yeah. yeah. That's right. Nick Bollettieri, the Florida tennis program that everyone yeah. seemed to have gone through. Skornikova back then, stuff. Yeah. 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 Amazing. So, so, I mean, so you grew up in Germany. I mean, were you not playing football as well, like soccer? Like, were you not? Very, a little bit, a little bit of soccer. Mm-hmm. But, like, I stopped that very quickly and just went full in tennis because I liked it very much. I was good at it, you know. And then, like, once you have a state ranking, you have a national ranking also. So, you know, you basically, under 10 and under, you don't have, like, a proper ranking yet. But, like, basically, I was, like, always in the top 10 in the nation. And then by the time you're 12 and under, you have a ranking. So I was always top 10 in the nation. So then once you're at that level as a junior as a, or a young kid, you like that's all you do. Mm-hmm. And there's nobody who is like in the top 10, top 20 in the nation in any sport that doesn't like go all in. So there's no two sport, two sport athletes or anything like this. You're, you're practicing all the time. You're practicing, you know, I mean, I was, uh, I went to school in the morning, uh, I remember I woke up at um, six o'clock. Um, I walked, uh, uh, left the house at six forty-three. Um, I arrived at the bus station um, at seven fifty-seven. Uh, the bus uh, six fifty-seven. The bus left at seven, and then I took the first bus. Then we had to change. I took the second bus, and then uh, school started at seven fifty. Um, and then I went had school until 1 p.m. My mom came, picked me up, and then we drove um, 
two times a week. Um, I mean, it changed over the years a little bit. Sure. But basically, since I was like eight years old, uh, five times a week, it was um, 100 miles to practice. Oh, my God. Really? And then practice for three hours, some PT maybe after, and then 100 miles back, do homework and eating in the car always. So where was the closest tennis center? I mean, 100 miles. Like yeah, because you then practice always with the national, like with the state squad or the national squad. And they only practice in it's certain like places. It was like in Frankfurt or in Kassel or... If you were practicing with a national team that's in Hannover, then I had to take a train. So that was even further. Then my mother couldn't drive me anymore. Mm -hmm. If it was with a, a state team, uh, then it was in Frankfurt. And it was if it was like the private uh, sessions or the uh, like the provincial team, then it was in Kassel. And that was like an hour drive. So it was either an hour or 90 minute driving one way or a two hour train ride. And that was five times a week. Oh my God! And then, and then the, every weekend, I mean, tournaments. Yeah, not every weekend, but like I'd say, twenty-five to thirty tournaments a year. Uh, and during uh, during the holidays, like Christmas and Easter, you always had training camps. So you always for sure, yeah, yeah. You don't get Christmas with your family. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it's a little. It was a little different for me. Like I played basketball, um, and I I started. My dad was in the uh, Olympics. He played. Uh, he played water polo. Actually, uh, oh, that's tough. That it's dirty. Yeah, that is. Uh, 1972 Olympics in Munich. Mm. Yeah, and uh, dear. Yeah, yeah. The uh, mm -hmm. that was where the terrorism attacks were. Right? So, so. But he always kind of instilled a lot of like training and 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 this kind of stuff in me. So I got into. But I he started getting me swimming, and then I actually played water polo for a little while, and it was too brutal. I couldn't handle it. <laughs> Um, so the Mount Everest. <laughs> yeah, no, water polo was terrible. Just being like having people pull you under and kick you and stuff. Uh -huh. it, was too, it was too much for me. Um, but then I picked up basketball when I was like six or seven. And, and then I remember like, I remember we were always playing on two teams. So we had a high school team. We had a, a, like a, a, a middle school team and a high school team. But then I was played on a rep team also. So I would have like morning practices. So I would get up at like six o'clock have practice from 6 30 to 8 30 school started at nine nine to four school go home eat sleep and then i had another training from seven to nine with another team and then go home try to do your homework and try to go to bed by midnight and then then it started up again that was like 15 years what was it like 12 years of my life at least In, insane what we do huh yeah. <laughs> i loved it well i, I left it going to school for sure yeah so so when you were so you were able to get out of school early mm. um, and then do your homework, you drive to tennis, um, thirty tournaments a year. That was amazing. Like, did you? Wh what was the goal for you? Was it to get a scholarship or some free education or go pro? Go pro. Yeah. I was. I was like, no. I had like. I was had no interest in any academic adventures whatsoever. Smart. smart. I was. So there was so not. Um, uh, an area of interest of mine. Yeah, I, I am because of tournaments. Uh, I also missed half of my school every year. Yeah. Um, for traveling to tournaments, so you're always catching up and stuff. Yeah, yeah. always catching up. But like the catching up, I didn't really catch up by learning and studying. I was just like whatever I needed to do. Called by one of my friend, one of my wife's best friends, and. She was sitting next to me in school. Actually, she lives in LA now. Yeah, uh, and like she's the one who I was copying like math homework. That's amazing. <laughs> it was like, yeah, I was not studying a lot because um, because I just didn't enjoy it. It didn't interest me yeah. at all. You must have been exhausted too, like doing that driving back and forth and all that and all the training and all the tournaments, like. I wouldn't say so. The retrospectively, I never felt like, oh my god, this is so much. I can't handle this. this I was enjoying it. I was liking it. I was sitting in the car. It's like, like not, not that rough. Yeah. Um, no, I wasn't like feeling like fatigue, physical or emotional, psychological in any shape. I was just that's what I wanted. Amazing. Yeah. That's so, such a pure feeling, right? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. was. I was pretty clear there. You know, and when when did you like? How did you progress to to becoming a professional tennis player then? Yeah, I mean, it's really just like based on like your results, right? So when I was sixteen, um, I then 
was then decided to go pro basically. Uh -huh. And what did you do? Like drop out of school or I yeah. dropped out of school after 10th grade, which is like, uh, in drum, the school system is a little different. Like um, if you do at the high school there, it's a little bit like higher than in the US. If you finish it, like in terms of the education that you receive, maybe it's like the first year of college, it, it's like included okay. Okay, in terms yeah. of how much you learn. Oh, well, you, the schools there are much better. It's 13 years, yeah. you know, you go to school. Um, and I dropped out after the, the 10th, which would be like maybe a little bit less than high school education. Okay. You know? Yeah. Um, so then I moved to Spain when I was 16. Oh, that's a nice place. And yes, to the very south, called a little fisher town called Marbella. Um, where like, it's a lot of people do vacation there, but it's really like a fisher town. And if it's not like seasonal vacation time, it's also not a lot is happening. Yeah. You know? um, and then uh, I started traveling 10 months, 11 months out of the year. Uh, and you just go to tournaments wherever you can get in first as a junior and hidden under. So basically you do the junior tour, mm -hmm. you know, so you play all the grand slams and like all the tournaments that are like graded A or one or two. And you try to, depending on, you know, how well you do, that depends on your ranking and what other tournaments you get into and so forth. And I was in a, back then there was a Mercedes-Benz team. Yeah, I that, remember that. Yeah, so I was kind of like part of it, you know. Um, Mercedes-Benz was also the big, uh, one of the big sponsors back in the day, remember? And they had their, they had like eight or nine like elite tournaments all around. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And and then because it was Germany and Boris Becker had just finished. Oh, he was a like legend. Me Mercedes, yeah, not anymore so much. Unfortunately, he had a couple of she had some problems. Challenges. Yeah. So, um, so what happened then? So I'm curious. I'm curious though. Let me interrupt yeah. you for a sec. So you're 16 years old. You move away from your family for the first time, and you go to Marbella yeah. to train. Yes. Like it must have been amazing. To not only be on out on your own, yes. but to be a professional athlete and to be living and training in Marbella. Like, what was that like leaving home? Like, were you? I'm assuming you were with a group of like-minded athletes, like training with one mm, one coach like, as well. Yeah. Tennis academy. Yeah. Which then later, once I had stopped, uh, I was the head pro of that academy and I was leading it. Oh, you went back. I well, I stayed there for 12 years basically. Oh, okay. I've lived in that town in Marbella for 12 years. The first six. Five to six was me as a player, and then I had to stop, mm. and then I became a coach. Mm. But, um, yeah, it was really, I mean, I loved it, but it was not that big of a deal for me. Like, if I think of today, a 16-year-old moving out of home into a different country and just doing things like, I don't feel like a lot of 16-year-olds, including their parents, feel like they are ready for that. Oh, really? It would be like, no, you need a few more years. Like, I don't even know, you know. And for me, because I had been traveling since I was 12 internationally already, mm. a lot, um, missing like half of every school year and being, you know, just like all over the place, mostly in Europe, but not only, uh, it didn't feel like that big of a step for me. It was just like, now I do what I did six months out of the year. I'm doing 12 months out of the year. And what was it like making that transition? Like, because obviously when you're when you're living in Germany, when you're at home with your family, you know, your parents are probably covering the costs of most of your training or extra training and commuting and all this kind of stuff. And then you go to you go to Marbella and now you've got to you've got to make your own money to 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 travel and to go to the tournaments and stuff like that. Like how much of a mind shift was that? Like just having to make the money to pay the academy, to pay yeah, for the travels. Uh, not quite. No. So when you're in, in Germany, okay, at least, and in many other countries, but every country it works a little different. Uh, for sure in the US it works differently. Um, you, um, everything is covered in Germany when you're oh, at really? a certain level. Okay. So, so if you're like in the top 10 in the nation or top three in your state, then all the training for you is paid for. That's the reason why I drove to Frankfurt. Right. Because I don't need a private coach who I have to pay, you know, 100 euros or whatever it is or wherever you would pay them. Everything is paid for, including the tournaments, including the travel. Oh, wow. Yeah. You guys are fully taken care of. Fully taken care of by the National Federation and the State Federation. Um, and 
uh, you were spo- I was uh, had a record sponsor and a clothing sponsor, so you didn't have to pay for those things. You didn't make money, but you also didn't have that many expenses. Okay. So in all the expenses that we did have, my parents covered. Okay. But it was not like cra- It wasn't like you were maybe thinking like in LA nowadays. You have to pay the private coach. You have to pay the plane, t- plane ticket. You have to pay all of that. That the right. But but when you started going to the international tournament, so then not because I was part of that Mercedes team. Oh, so you got everything covered. So yes, they covered a lot, and then my parents still covered some part, and then my mentor, who was the head coach of the Mercedes team, uh, he covered also for me. He also helped. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So I re- I didn't have. Like we had expensive and it still was a lot, but it was a fraction of it would be if you had to pay everything at full price. Yeah, because like, you know, um, coming at this, like I played team sports my whole life, so I don't necessarily understand how it works or the mentality. But, you know, you see the players at, on um, on uh, on the Netflix series or something mm-hmm. like that, like they have a coach that they coach gets us, you know, a percentage of the winnings. And then they, you know, they've got a personal trainer and a mental trainer and the and you know their parents are around and all this stuff and you just think about all these plane tickets and all these hotel rooms that they have to they, like their playing has to pay those fees or their sponsorships up and it, it must get into the millions like cost per year of being a professional tennis player in the for top sure. 30 yes yeah. for sure for sure i mean and that's also uh why it's so difficult i mean a lot of the players at the top don't have a team like that you know because I mean, they can't afford it some players that share a coach yeah, that's right, yeah. You know, I mean, if you're top 30 in singles, you're doing very well, you know. If you're top 30 in doubles... No one's heard of you. doing so well, you know. I mean, you're not making a fraction of the money and you're still an incredible tennis player. You're right. You know. Um, uh, also, there are certain athletes that don't see maybe the need or the value in paying a certain coach a certain amount so and they're trying to like maybe pay a little less mm-hmm. you know and then there's other players that think that's the most important and they invest in those people basically in themselves you know and then it works out you know for some not for all how hard is it being like 18 19 20 and having to make those financial decisions because those are i mean those are those well, are those are real those are really difficult decisions yes, to make. Yes. Yes, but I mean I until I as long as I was playing I was kind of a part of that Mercedes team. So you were, you were sheltered the men amount of the travel. Yeah. Uh and then once I kind of transitioned into men's tennis so to speak, um then I ha- started having already my injuries. Okay. And I wasn't playing in the men's circuit for very long um because of my arm issue um and then i had a surgery and then that was it and i re i started coaching already when i was uh 22 oh wow so it was really just a five or six year window yeah and in in those like from 18 to 22 there were at least two years where i couldn't play oh my god just because of injuries yes yeah because i broke my right hand i broke my foot uh those were not even the bad injuries uh, and then the arm that took me out. Wow. It's amazing how quickly that can turn. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah, so, do, so I mean, you might, so what were, did you play all the major tournaments, like the Grand Slams in yeah. the juniors? In the juniors, I played all four of them. Mm-hmm. What was that like? Great. I mean, the Grand Slams are like a whole other level. Yeah. It, incomparable with any other tournament. Even Indian Wells, which is a fantastic tournament. Just a few blocks away. Yeah. Yeah, but the Grand Slams is, like, is another level. Yeah. I mean, you went to the Australian Open and played as a junior. I mean, the, that must have been insane. That like Wimbledon playing on the grass. Yes. Incredible memories. Yes, yes. I mean, Australian Open especially because I played with Federer there. We played doubles together. Are you serious? Yeah. So that it's incredible. Was, you know, that was a nice. You know, we did well semifinals. We played in doubles, and there was. A, it's a nice memory for sure. That's amazing. And uh, did you, I mean, what was, what were some of the highlights of your junior career? Did you have any, anything that sticks with you specifically other than the yeah, Federer? I think the Australian Open, yeah. you know, that's probably for sure. And with Roger, I mean, nobody could have thought that he's going to be that great. And he, and he you played know. with you, you guys played together as professionals or as juniors? Juniors. Oh. Juniors. But like the next year already, he, 
you know, got a wild card into Basel, beat Moya, who was top five or top ten at least in the world, and like and went super quick. You yeah, know, and then he beat what he beat Sampras at Wimbledon or beat Sampras in the U.S. Open, and then he just never lost for like ten years. I mean, he was. I remember thinking like when when I played him in the warm up tournament to the Australian Open, I played him in the quarterfinals against him in singles in singles. And I lost like whatever six six three six two or something, and I wasn't playing bad, you know. And a lot of times when you play with somebody who is better than you, then um, you can also only play as good as your opponent lets you play, so to speak. Yeah, that's right? important. It's yeah. a little bit. It's different than like golf. Let's say you can play like amazing, still not win, but like your opponent isn't impacting your game in any shape. That's interesting, yeah. You know? Very good point. So in tennis, very much so, you know. And every, anytime you have an opponent who's like trying to interfere somehow with whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. direct. So when we, when I was playing him, I remember thinking also the match following that he played, which was then like I think against Olivier Rocuse, who was also good. I think he was top ten in there eventually. Um, I was thinking like, I mean, how good does somebody have to be if they're in the top 100 in the world if that guy if he's playing like this I, it didn't make sense to me like he should be pro, ranked higher yeah the professionals I mean he was ranked very high he just hasn't played any professional tournaments yet mm. but in my head at that time and that age I was thinking like the professionals can't be better than this this is like he's not doing anything wrong of course I didn't realize that also for him he can only play as good as the opponent lets him play so but he was playing very well. Yeah. He I had a temper issue. I, I Did he? Because <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he was an ice man for like ever. For his for his whole professional career, he like never showed he any had, emotion. Like, a point. You can look it up for sure. It's like an interview somewhere on YouTube or something because he was like the exact opposite. He was like a, I wouldn't say a Kyrgios, you know, who's like a, a, a different mentality. Oh, Nick Kyrgios, like, the Australian guy. Yeah. yeah, but like, I mean, he would get very upset very upset we would practice once and i was beating him like in a practice tie break you know and and he was got so upset he threw the racket over the fence and left the court okay you know yeah um wow and then i remember there was one match like very early on in his professional career where he got so upset that he realized he lost because he got so upset and that was and, and that was it, the moment it made like the, which very hardly ever happens to anybody. He it was such a decisive moment in his life, for that aspect of his life, mm. that he was able to make the choice and to have that realization that, like I'm never going to do this again. Mm. And and he never did. Amazing. Yeah. Can you imagine if McEnroe had the same power over his yeah. over his temper? Yeah. Wow. So 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 what was it like? Kind of. I mean. So I had this kind of realization as well. Like I, I, I wanted to play for my national team for Canada basketball, and I, you know, I had ambitions of maybe playing professionally, maybe internationally, because I wasn't going to have to play in the NBA or anything like that. I was thinking maybe I could play in Australia or maybe somewhere in Europe, or something like this. Um, but at 22, I just couldn't. Like I just wasn't good enough, and and I was so kind of uh, burnt out with my sporting career that I moved to China. Like I just kind of, I never picked up a basketball. I didn't pick up a basketball f for almost 25 years mm -hmm. until a, a few months ago. Actually, I started playing again, but, um, which is funny. But, uh, but when I was 22, I was so burned out. I, I went off and just started a whole new life for myself that had nothing to do with, with basketball. Um, cause I was just completely destroyed mentally and physically. I mean, what was it wh when you were kind of going through those injuries and having to do the rehab and having to do the physical therapy, the PT, like, you know, how hard was it for you to to stop playing and start coaching versus you know continuing to just keep kind of rehab these injuries again and again which i know must have been mind numbing yeah it was an interesting period of my life was it dark or was it happy it wasn't happy no probably but not it wasn't dark okay. it was just like i was always kind of um held back from being able to reach my optimal level of performance physic physically because of injuries. Interesting. It's always like, 
for most athletes what happens is like if you make it, it you make it because like you have these periods of like you're doing really well all of a sudden and then you kind of ra ride this wave right and then maybe there is a little dip and then and then the dip might be pretty short or and and the wave that you're riding might be very long right yeah. but you have to get to this point where you're like oh now it's really happening you're feeling it everything is working out you're confident like all the pieces fall into place and every time i was like getting to that point or at that point i got injured so you could feel it like you could feel it when it started all coming together yeah, yeah. because you're just like it's flowing everything it's not like in one match it's flowing it's just like you're winning all the matches you're feeling good like everything is in place you as a player you know when it's yeah. yeah just ruthless confidence yes yeah, because but based on the results right you know it's not like i believe because i think i will be able to it's like no i know because it's happening it's happening all the time i love that you know because with with tennis it's it with tennis it's all on your shoulders mm -hmm. like there's no one to look mm -hmm. look towards right i remember games I remember games in high school and university where, you know, I would have 20, 25 points or something. I play incredible, but we'd still lose. And even though my confidence was rocket high and I was playing really well, we, we still couldn't get over the hump. You know, we couldn't get into that win category, couldn't get into the playoffs. And it was, uh, you know, frustrating days. But, it, but in tennis, it's all on you. So if you're winning, the confidence goes up so fast. And if you're losing it, it's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So... For in my case, what happened then was um, I was injured so frequently for like longer periods, you know, like months at a time, always like a month or four months, you know, over and over with something unrelated that what sorry to interrupt you what was it like wrists ankles back yeah so for i broke my wrist once and then i started playing too soon and that re resulted in an inflammation of like the mid hand Jeez. um and then uh, and then I uh, twisted my ankle and like ruptured like a tendon, um, and then and then the shoulder started. Mm. And and I had it already when I was younger with like lo lower back issues that were pretty bad. And for six months I couldn't do something. So I was kind of used to that somewhat. But it kind of had this effect that I um, wanted to make it to the very top, but I didn't believe it because of these physical injuries it's just like chances started to be lower it's not that i was doubting myself i would i would uh, just not think about it. it was not like a thought that occurred but i was just doing tennis was my life so once uh then in order to continue playing i had a surgery which they removed my first rib oh jesus so, yeah so there was like it took again four months rehab after their surgery um, in or and I only did that surgery so I can continue playing. I wouldn't have needed the surgery if I would have decided not to play. And it was so. Was it your ro rotator cuff or like? Cause you're right-handed, right? It was called thoracic outlet syndrome, um, which basically uh, means that your um, collarbone and the first rib they kind of cross like this, and then when you move your arm to a certain position, they can get too close, and right where they cross, also or veins, arteries, and nerves cross. And if it gets too close, it pinches it. And then... And that's exactly your, like, serving rotation. Yes, exactly. Forehands and serves. Oh. However, I had the surgery, and that was not my the cause of my pain. Oh, really? So after rehab, uh, the first day I played all out again, I got the exact same pain that I had before the surgery. Or would they just misdiagnosed it? Well, no, I had a thoracic outlet syndrome. It just wasn't the cause of pain. It was another another yeah. issue. Another whatever. I, still, uh, I went for nine months to experts, like from one to the next. Nobody could figure it out. Oh, wow. Or like nerve testing and everything. Nowadays, now uh, one of the uh, players that I had coached, uh, he had the exact same issue, way worse than me. Two months of physical therapy and it was gone. Really? Yeah. So they were able to diagnose it faster? Yes. Yeah, so and I mean, you know, it's 50, not 50. 25 years later, you yeah. know, they know much more. 20 years later, they know more, you yeah. know. We're both old guys in our 40s. No one cares about us anymore. <laughs> you know? So, um, so that day when I decided, okay, this is it. I'm not playing anymore. That was not replaced with, this is what I'm going to do instead. 
I was kind of in limb. I didn't know what I want, what I'm going to do. I didn't know either. Yeah. yeah. It's ter terrifying, right? You spend your whole life doing something and then you can't do it anymore. Someone takes it away from you. So then I was like, my dad came to Spain. We took a walk at the beach. I was like, it's like, I don't know. And like I could go to college easily, you know. No, don't go to college. Uh, but, uh, no, but I mean, it would have, would have, was an option, you yeah. know. Get a scholarship. Like, uh, if you're like at that level of tennis, it's very easy to get a scholarship in know? Germany or in the U.S. In the U.S. Yeah, yeah, in the U.S. Um, but I didn't want to because I wasn't interested in academics whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I was like doing a little bit computer stuff and marketing was like it's not like an area of interest. I had tried to do a little programming, did like a test there and then, and then my mentor who was coaching me, um, an amazing human and very successful tennis coach, he said, "Why don't you like try coaching? I think like you might have like a talent for it, some some unique vision." Yeah. yeah. So I was like, "Yeah, why not?" So like I was coaching in the academy a little bit and I was enjoying it I was liking it and I was good at it like I was really able to kind of connect with the players in a way that like some other coaches couldn't do you think that was because of your injury experiences plus also your age you were younger no that's just my personality I think that's like independent of the knowledge I have independent of the level of tennis that I had that uh, was not unique you know, I mean, there's a lot of players that played almost professional or fully professional. Um, and obviously, I didn't have a lot of knowledge yet as a coach, especially, you know. So it was just like how mind, how my mind was combining things, what I was emphasizing, how I was motivating. That was like my talent. That was something I didn't need to learn. So it was really like a, a mental approach to the game. Uh, no, not at that point. At that point, it was more like me um, really loving it and this enjoyment that I had on the court with the players and having this ability to explain things that I thought mattered in that moment in a way that the player could pick it up and understand because that's like that's a barrier for a lot of uh, coaches and athletes, right? The, the great coaches in the world have all of this right to right. explain what's to going explain on in a way that the athletes understands. Yeah. And Good. not just explain what's happening, explain it the way the athlete understands. Yeah. That is the key. Yeah. You can, and, um, and the great coaches can adjust the explanation to every athlete in a way that that athlete understands. And the not so great coaches, but still great, have one way of explaining things and then only the players that understand the coach will be able to work with them. Interesting. You know? uh, that's that's very interesting. So, yeah, they, having this idea of the coaches kind of adjusting the message to fit the player. Yes. And yeah. then um, uh, that's just like in terms of the language that you use, you know, and what you emphasize and how you can motivate this player and what is important to that player and so forth. And then, of course, there's a whole, uh, other dimensions of like, what does that athlete need to practice? What is that focus strategically and physically and mentally? That, that's all, all. So at the age at the age of twenty two, you were able to see the game that clearly based on your no, early I, early I, career. Whatever I was doing was connecting. So you you were just there was like a natural gift. Yeah, that was like my natural. Gift. Oh, but that was like the gift that I had that I never knew that I had. Oh, well, that's interesting. And that was the gift that my coach realized or thought that I had. So he identified it. Yes. He is the one that, that's why he said, like, I think you would be good. He was seeing how it was like, you know, whether it was a little kid that was eight years old or 10, or whether it was a um, 50 year old uh, lady that was just starting to play tennis, or whether it was good, uh, good juniors or professional players, I was able to talk to them and it worked. Wow. You know? That's a great skill to have. Yeah. That was, that, that's a skill that I was given. You know, I didn't do anything for it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I don't kind of really take any credit. So, so how much how much time did you take off between retiring from being a professional tennis player to starting your professional coaching career? Like, was it one day, or did you take six months off and go to Thailand, or yeah, just that quick? Yeah. Um, and then, so then I did like my training um, certification. You know, that took like two years. But honestly, like. I didn't learn really 
that much there. Where I really learned to teach was through my mentor who was teaching me to teach six years every day, four to six hours. Wow, that's so incredible. Very fortunate. Um, I don't know a lot of people. I mean, I personally don't know anybody who had was in such a fortunate situation where you have somebody with 50, 60 years of experience and success being with you side by side while you are coaching, telling you what to do, what to adjust, what you just said, what you shouldn't have said, you know, what you should look at, what you should emphasize, what you should not mention right now, how to guide somebody. So I had that while I was coaching and, and I was being taught to teach while I was teaching. Mm -hmm. So that kind of took me on a road. And, I, and then on top of that, I was, you know, successful as a coach early on. So I was coaching Azarenka in the juniors. So she explained, I mean, she was an amazing player, still is, and won the junior Australian Open, singles, doubles, French Open, this, that, and the like. And, you know, then it were. And, and so, so what are some of the professional players that you've coached uh, uh, at, the, at any level? Um, so Azarenka, I coached, Petkovic. I coach. Okay. Um, then the German national, the German female uh, national team, because they were, we were the base for the German Tennis Federation. Okay. Spain. So they would come and visit and would be there for a week or two weeks or three weeks. So a lot of times I was teaching um, for that period of time the national teams. Mm -hmm. um, then. Uh, Tatiana Malek, she changed her name now because she got married and I forgot and she just like reached the semifinals of last year, I think it was me. Oh, that's incredible. And then uh, Mike Bryan was the last one when he won his world championship the last time. Okay. Wow. So uh, amazing. So, I mean, like, it's funny. Like, I think some people, some people transition from being an athlete to a coach and sometimes it's like a difficult transition. Because sometimes when you're a high-level athlete, you can't explain what you do, right? You just do it. And you do it right, and you do it well, and you win, and everyone's happy for you. But then to be able to like explain that to someone who's still learning and still trying to become a professional is such a transition. It's not an easy transition at all. No, no, because, I mean, having the experiential knowledge and ability to do something um, really has hardly anything, if anything at all, to do with understanding the methodology and the biomechanical principles of how something needs to be done. So if an athlete has an issue with a certain shot, um, you know how it needs to be executed, but you don't understand yourself as a coach most of the time what the issue is at hand that prohibits them from doing this thing that they need to be do that you know they should be doing but like you don't know where the problem is how much do you think uh how much do you think the percentage difference is between a good like for a good tennis player to have like physical capabilities versus mental capabilities because you know i still have a book on my bookshelf um and it's called the inside game of tennis very famous book yeah. that talks about like inner game of tennis right that's it the inner game of tennis and it just talks about um all of the mental aspects of being in a sport on your own and all the mind games that go on with the crowd, your opponent, how they try to take you out of your rhythm, how you try to take your opponent out of your rhythm. And I remember reading it because I was using it for basketball and stuff like that. And um, it's just, I feel like, I feel like maybe golf and tennis are probably the two most mentally challenging sports in the world because everything is on you all the time. I mean, with, like you said, with golf, you're playing the course, but with tennis, you're not really playing the course, you're playing an opponent who's trying to unravel you at every moment. And I feel like the course is designed to unravel you at any moment. So either way, you're screwed. I mean, the, the book is an amazing book, yeah. for sure. It was like one of the first books to kind of dive into the realm of using certain mental skills, um, not really giving a methodology of how to train those, but creating awareness and understanding of how they function to a degree. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how to deal with adversity rather than not having necessarily such an antagonistic relationship with that, being able to allow challenges, whether they're internal, external, physical, mental, whatever. 
um, awareness, meta-awareness, directing attention and so forth. That was kind of all part of that book mm -hmm. in a in a very in nice way. You know, I mean, it was a great... It was it was well packaged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very good for sure. Yeah, and it stands the test of time. Also, I mean, people, you know, nowadays it's an old book and people reference it, and there's it's still like on point. Mm -hmm. In in dealing with a lot of these younger athletes as a coach, like how how many of them needed like that mental toughness that just didn't have it? Because I find like I find like a lot of a lot of players. I mean, tennis not not so much, but in basketball. You know, we would have younger players on our team. We would have older players on our team, and not a lot of the not a lot of the older players enjoyed helping the younger players figure out how to mentally respond for, to adversity. Mm. Like, you know, being down for in you know, a basketball reference, like being down twenty points in the first half. You know, maybe the equivalent of losing the first two sets of a five set match, right? Like, how do you forget about the first half and only focus on what you need to do in the second half? And you know, forget about the disappointment, and only focus on what needs to be done now. Like, like, because I feel like I just, again, going back to like how our parents had tougher lives than we do. I feel like a lot of people nowadays are not as mentally focused or as tough maybe as they were back in the day. And I wonder, I'm wondering like how you saw that coaching. Yeah. So I mean, I would say um, first, in order to make it in any sport. Right, you need the physical ability. Mm -hmm. If you don't have, you you're you're finished. As strong mentally as you want, you know you you won't be able to do it. I mean, uh, LeBron James can't become the best tennis player in the world. He doesn't have the physical skill, and and Djokovic can't be the best basketball player in the world. Yeah. You know, um, so th the physical skill. It'd be a good matchup, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the the strategical skills and understanding. Mm -hmm. um, the intuition that comes with it that, that's also something that is something that's very hard to teach or if impossible yeah you know? yeah um is kind of of course at the foundation and absolutely crucial for and a necessity for anybody to make it to the very top and i don't mean just to the top 10 but like just professional okay but now Let's just say what um, most players, especially nowadays, there's, of course, differences in strategy and differences in strength, but everybody is very strong. Everybody is very fast. Um, nobody is completely misunderstanding the game strategically. Yeah. Uh, they all have a basic understanding. You know, it's all like, that's not really why you're winning or losing. Okay, let's take, you know, Djokovic out. Or if Nadal out, it's okay. Like if you make the argument that there's like this player, no, that player is just so much better than me physically. Their shots, okay. But the vast majority of matches that you play, you never lose because you're not good enough to win physically, mm -hmm. or you're not good enough to win because your stamina isn't strong enough, or you didn't know what you needed to be doing. At that level, it's all top top. At, at Basically, you know, if the players from the top 20 to the top 100 play against each other, you know, or the players from the from 100 to 250 or from 250 to 800, you know, there's like jumps in strength, stamina and shot selection that happens. But that's not that big of a difference. Like if you see uh, somebody who is you know, maybe in the top 10 in the nation in the U.S. in college tennis, you, there's hardly a difference to a, to a guy that's in the top 100. Right. If you would see them play and they're playing practice matches and they're playing tribacks, anybody can win anytime. Mm -hmm. So um, if you now understand that the issue is not the physicality, the strength, stamina, and strategy, then it must be something internal. Mental toughness. So... Yeah, but so, but what is that then? That is always like, yeah, you need to be mental tough, mentally tough. How do I get mentally tough? What do I have to do? <laughs> yeah, but that's kind of the definition then that um, I think the people that I work with a lot of times lack. And I was one of those people that was lacking that also. Okay, so so walk me through. Come a little closer to the mic. So so just walk me through. Walk me through this realization. So 
So when I was coaching, that basically we're going back in time now, I was coaching and I was um, doing well as a coach. And I was realizing already at that time, even though I hadn't developed those skills myself, I didn't have an understanding of that you even could develop mental skills. Mm -hmm. um, but I did realize that most of those players that I was coaching, um, the only reason why they weren't performing at their best, the, the level that they know they can play and they have played five minutes ago or, or an hour ago or yesterday. On the practice court. Right. Yeah, or even in the match, yeah. right? I mean, that level fluctuates even in the practi practice sessions. Mm -hmm. um, is for just very few reasons. Either they're not paying attention to what they need to pay attention to in order to perform their best. They're getting distracted, mm -hmm. right? And the distraction could be anything. Could be internal, your thoughts, could be your feeling, you're starting to be anxious or angry, uh, and you're, that is distracting you. Your attention is moving towards the emotions rather than to watching the ball, right? Mm -hmm. Some crazy person in the crowd. Any, it could be any, yeah, anything, whatever. Your the, your attention only needs to be on one thing when you play tennis, and that's watching the ball. Interesting. If you're not watching the ball, you're done. You can't play, you can't hit the ball. What about like your opponent's body language or you know some things like this? Yeah, I mean that's like in the background mm -hmm. somewhat, and you will then make strategic decisions based on. But I'm just talking while you're playing the point. Okay. Your focus needs to be on the ball, and you of course see also peripherally your opponent that information is hitting your retina and you're using that subconsciously but you really you need to be watching the ball and that is one big mistake that a lot of people do that they don't realize on any level is that they will take all their eye off the ball just a moment too early for a number of reasons because they think they need to hit a winner now and then just before they hit it they look to where they need to play and already they will miss it so you would think that's such a basic concept is don't take your eye off the ball and yet it's something is realizing that you're doing it right because you're doing it subconsciously aren't you you're not knowing that you're doing it. it's like um, <laughs> you might not be knowing that your left wrist is touching your right wrist right now but it's touching it yeah it's it's happening but you don't know that it's happening mm -hmm. And if the coach isn't picking it up, because that's such a subtle detail, it happens in split seconds, and if you don't make that connection, then you will never see. And it only might happen in certain moments. It might only happen at breakpoints. When the stress is higher. For example, exactly. Yeah. You know, or when the desire increases to hit a winner, or when the fear increases to make a mistake. You know, anything for different players, there's different triggers. So that's wow. one, you know. Um, one of a million. One or one of a million. And then it was also the ability to deal with challenges. Yeah. And all the players have the have certain ability to do, deal with certain challenges. And then there's always one or two challenges that they had a very low threshold. And if that challenge would arise, the performance would dip. So give me give me an example of like a a, a challenge that one of your players that you coach. You don't have to mention their name. Mm -hmm. Give me an example of one challenge that they could rise to and beat or overcome and one challenge where they just couldn't compete or, or just it destroyed them mentally so it would um it's not as obvious as that right it's just like you make a mistake then yeah or often you or you make more other first errors mm -hmm. so um let's say a certain kind of fear okay. will have that trigger but that fear is only triggered in very specific instances right okay so um, let's say you're playing against somebody and he already before the match even, you might be thinking, oh, if I will win this match, I will reach this ranking. And now you get afraid of not achieving it or afraid of what people will think about it. Nothing worse than thinking about where you're going to be. That causes a certain feeling. Yeah. And then these thoughts and these feelings are what hijack your attention. So you're paying attention to that rather than to watching the ball because you can don't have the ability to, to allow those experiences to be there and already you're not playing. But wow. the player won't talk about it. You can't know it. You're not doing psychotherapy sessions as a tennis coach generally, right? And the the player might not even be aware of it either. They might like, yeah, they might be feeling a little fear. 
Um, they might be thinking about it, but not intentionally. It's just like thoughts that are more in the background. It's a feeling that's hovering there, but players have um, unpleasant emotions and unpleasant physical body sensations of fatigue and pain. It's not uncommon, and they themselves can't make the connection that this particular kind of sensation or those, the group of those, those three thoughts, and those thoughts might be visual thoughts even, not even auditory thoughts, are the ones that just hijack their attention 50% more of the time than any other unpleasant emotion, um, and that's why they're playing worse. Incredible. Yeah. The mind is wild, isn't it? I have, a, I have a question for you. So when you and I, or at least when I was playing basketball back in the day, uh, we didn't have social media. Thank you. <laughs> and, and, you know, when we played bad, you know, maybe we would get an earful from our coach. Maybe the assistant coach would sit us down one-on-one -on -one and talk us through some things. Maybe the next day we would watch some tape and be like, okay, when this guy goes there, you got to slide like this or blah, blah, blah. And okay, because there's 10 guys on the court, five on five. You need to be moving all the time. This You made a mistake here. This guy scored or something. But we didn't have like a thousand people writing on social media that were shit and then tagging us. How, how has social media really affected some of the players you've coached like in a positive or negative way? Because what you just explained to me about distraction and thinking before the match about something that might happen after the match. I mean, this is surrounding players more today than at any other time in history mm -hmm. yeah i mean um i have been away from teaching tennis okay uh, for a bit now and i'm more in mental performance coaching in general mm -hmm. um and the social media aspect i think is like a i think what you just mentioned is an issue mm -hmm. but it's a smaller issue in comparison to just the degree of addiction that they experience and the experiences that they have when they're experiencing an absence of usage from social media and it changes the landscape it changes their attentional skills you know once they're on the instagram or something for three hours four hours a day you are training your mind into the wrong direction you're like starting to increase your ADD, rather you you have a deficit in attention, not focusing on the ball, then learning to direct your attention, right? Mm. So that is more more the I th I think okay the bigger issue. There's a lot of studies on that also of like um, how uh, negative or what kind of negative impact social media has, um, and. I think a lot of players by now are aware of that. For sure, yeah. People in general, and they're trying to limit their usage to a degree. Um, you know, you hear that in sports, you hear that in the entertainment industry. When you do, when you work on a project, you're successful, people like it, everybody is um, celebrating you into heaven. Which and is wonderful. If you do something that's not so good, uh, or maybe it didn't work out, and then everybody's trashing you to a degree where it's not even like you would never do that to a, per people, a person's face. No, the social media is the best for that. There was like these two movies now. I think one was on the Netflix Rebel Moon and then the other one was like Madam Web. Oh yeah, they got trashed. Yes. Yeah. And I was just like thinking, I mean, I watch Rebel Moon also. That's my genre of movies and I didn't like the movie. But regardless, there's hundreds and hundreds of people working on that putting their lifeblood in there. And then there's many people that treat them in su such a disrespectful way to talk about somebody who's like putting everything they have into that that is having an effect on the people working on it. Ter terribly. The, that they need to go to therapy then when they read all of these um, reviews. And it could even destroy their career and their income opportunities yeah. for the future. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a nightmare. I was not saying that, like, um, you know, a critic or even an audience member should not voice their opinions. Like, I didn't like the movie and I think this and that wasn't working or that or what. But, like, really derogatory remarks and trashing it, there's a there's kind of, you can make a pretty, you know, clear cut, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, that, and that is 
not helpful, I think, for our uh, for society. Agreed. To the for sure. That I, I have like removed myself to my the best of my ability from all of that. That's good. Yeah, yeah that's a, a powerful thing. I mean, I doubled down. Now I'm doing this. So yeah, yeah even more. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, I mean, I think podcasts are great, and mm -hmm. like not also all of social media. I think falls into that. Let's say like LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if they have these algorithms and stuff. It doesn't like grab you like that mm -hmm. for sure maybe people are trashing on there sometimes but like and there's certain kind of platforms that are more conducive to um positivity yeah positivity and others that are more like detrimental to your well-being yeah i always wanted to do like the way i wanted to do this is to do it long form so i didn't want to do like a sound bite i didn't want to do like 30 minutes like i wanted a chance for people to really come here mm -hmm. and leave with myself and the audience like knowing who you are yes over a period of time where we can you know exhaust a great many topics yes, yeah. yes. i love that that is exactly i i think there is because everything has been so shortened and the attention pen, uh, span has shortened from a lot of people in the world um media that is being consumed has been shortened whether it's visual media uh, auditory media or um, even written form media um, and because it's gotten so extreme and such an overload, I think there's going to be a good chunk of the population that's going to move the opposite direction, like you and m me also. Like, I love talk for two, three, four hours, mm -hmm. you know, listen to something in depth. The, the devil is in the detail. Like, life is complicated. You can't just use everything to 10 seconds or 60 seconds. I really find, like, I was on another aside, I really find these conversations almost therapeutic because... Um, before I started doing them, I can't remember the last time I would spend two hours or three hours with someone without being on my phone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here we come into the studio, we turn our phones off and it's just this, right? And, and it's, uh, it's just something that I was lacking in my life. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people must be lacking it too, if I feel that way. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So let's go back to Marbella. You retire as a professional tennis player at 22 with a shoulder injury that was serious you had a surgery but it was also another problem that was kind of misdiagnosed okay then you start coaching then you coach in marbella for 10 years 12 years though so there was like no no we we're like in 2003 four mm -hmm. so i moved there in 1998 wow yeah uh and then i was coaching in spain for like six to seven years mm -hmm. but I was traveling a good chunk of that also. So with Azarenka, I was traveling to tournaments. With Petkovic, I was traveling. But not as much as when I was playing myself. Then you're traveling 10, 11 months out of the year. Which is crazy. Yeah. yeah. And then as a coach, I was traveling sometimes six months and then sometimes leading the academy and coaching there a lot, you know. So I was there. Um, and that was going very well. Coaching was going great. I had a, um, I had a partner there. Um, we broke up I mean, we got together basically when I moved to Spain, you know, so we were very young. I was 16, she was 15 mm -hmm. and then we stayed together for six years. Then that relationship ended and there was like a little on and off for a few years. But then basically, um, in 2000 and, um, 2009, uh, it's 2009, no, 2008. Mm -hmm. I think like Facebook started to come around. Right? Yes, yeah, or yeah, that's roughly that cyber frame. Yeah. So what I did uh, was like reconnected with some of my uh, sc old school friends. Mm -hmm. So one of those people was Nargis, my wife. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's how we kind of reconnected. We didn't talk or have any connection for 12 years. And then Facebook happened. So Facebook happened and like, so, and I was living in Spain, she was living in Germany. And, um, I mean, this goes into my like private, so, I, you know, maybe I'm not going to go really deep into that. Um, but I was a long story. It's a but, long story. <laughs> Did you invite Mark Zuckerberg to the wedding? <laughs> wedding. Well, so we, reconnected on Facebook, I'm going to do it super short. Yeah. And then basically, uh, I was coaching in uh, Israel on a tournament. I flew back over via Germany to Spain, spent a day there and just 
connected with a couple of people, including Nargas. Mm -hmm. And um, she was in my hometown, not in Berlin. So I said, I haven't, haven't seen my parents in a year. Uh, I'll visit them and we can have dinner. So we had dinner. Um, I extended it for a day. And then three weeks later, I proposed. Eight weeks later, we got married. Oh, wow. Uh, and, uh, and, and another uh, three weeks later, I moved away from Spain to back to Germany. Wow, uh, fast we mover. We in together, uh, and then we were in Germany for a year, and then we moved here. That's what I wanted to really get at, but I appreciate the story about you and your wife, which is fast. That's that's great. That's amazing. Um, but I'm curious, like, so you went back to Germany, but how did you end up out here in California? Like, because we're in Los Angeles today. You've been here since, what, 2009, 2010? So um, I was in Spain. We were, like, thinking about where are we going to go? I was she could have moved to Spain, right? We could have moved kind of anywhere where we had to decide what are we going to do. We just like could you have coached in Spain for like another twenty years, or did yeah. you feel like you were plateauing as a coach? No, I mean uh, my mentor he offered me like a part of the company as co-owner. Oh wow! Um, and uh, I had a house there at that time. Yeah. Um, but it was just it was time to move on. It was time to move on. There's there is that feeling right inside, yeah. where it's like I gotta just get out of here and feel it, something different. It was like also like you know my uh, uh, my relationship, my previous relationship. She lived there, and it was just like it was kind of my old life. And once my wife and me got together, um, it had to be like a cut, some new adventure. Yeah, some something new that was not like I could bring her in there. She didn't want it, and it wouldn't have been good. Um, and for me now, retrospectively, it was the b best thing in my life. That one of the best things that she did to me was basically take me away from there. Right. I had an amazing 12 years there, but it was also the height. Uh, if I would have stayed longer, I think I would have gone. Uh, not it wouldn't have continued to go upward. That's that's amazing timing. Yeah, because not a lot of people know when to exit. Very, very, yeah, I didn't. I didn't only did it because we were in, crazy in love. I didn't right. do it like for professional reasons. You know, I was like at that. I was young. I was twenty-eight. Uh, I was coaching well. I was successful. Most players my age were playing still. Nobody was coaching at twenty-eight. Yeah, I had already coached people w being successful. So um, everybody was. Kind of shaking the head a little bit and looking at me um, with a, a tilted head that I was giving all of that up and going to Germany. And in Germany, I decided I'm not going to coach tennis um, because Germany in general, you know, not, not the people like that are in your immediate circle and friends of yours, but like in Germany, the culture is a little bit more envious. It's a little harder to be successful and then having other people celebrate you right so that's not so common in germany interesting it's i didn't know maybe uh, that that's more common but maybe in business and in other sports or coaches it's not like you know people kind of keep no one's happy for you yeah not so much and like don't you know show off too much and stuff like that that's very german yeah, yeah. it's a little bit like that and that's not quite my vibe um and additionally the weather is a disaster. Oh my God, Berlin. worst. And for nine months, I didn't see the blue sky. Yeah, it's and awful. I, I couldn't anymore. Mm -hmm. So then uh, my wife and I decided to move to LA and try it. Like nobody knew. We didn't tell my parents, tell anybody. Did you have any friends here? Did you have any business opportunities? Like nothing. It, Just America. I one guy and my wife knew one friend. We came in here. Um, this was 2010. Exactly. No. What? 2010. Yes. 2010. Yeah. Um, because of tennis, it was um, easy for me to get a visa, for, like right. a professional yeah. athlete's visa, basically. That was not an issue. But, of course, I didn't know what's going to happen. Like, I didn't know anybody, you know, with no opportunities. I knew my skill set. I knew what I can do. I, my perspective was I just need to get somewhere in and then it's going to go. Now is is LA is LA a hub for professional tennis players like Florida is? I didn't care about professional tennis. I wanted to just teach tennis. Okay. I, at I, any level. Uh at any I wanted to actually stay away from professional sports because um if you are a uh if you're coaching a professional athlete 
then you are at the mercy of one other human being. Which has to be miserable. Which is most of the time, there's always exceptions, right. you know, but most of the time it's very young, mm -hmm. inexperienced, and if it's not going well, then the coaches will be to blame. Sometimes that's correct also, but definitely not all the time. Sure. Um, and, and then you're there. So your entire livelihood is dependent on one very young human being with so much stress on their shoulders exactly and and you're traveling the whole world i've already traveled my whole life i di didn't feel the need to be on all these tournaments and travel the whole world i wanted to be with my wife in a location that i really love and with with the sunshine yes and i loved la it's my favorite city always mm. um and she loved la and we wanted to be together here so i was like and For me, teaching in general, whatever it is that I teach, whether it's tennis or mindfulness or any of... I don't teach a lot of other things that I don't get into anything else. Mm -hmm. um, what matters to me is the level of interest and commitment and passion and joy the person that I am teaching is experiencing. Sure, that makes sense. I do not care if you have touched the racket for the first time in your life or if you are... Uh, the best player in the world unlikely if you're the best player in the world there is not a lot of passion but like there has to be a human connection with you. sure that makes sense um, and so fortunately for me um, there is not a lot of coaches that have coached professional athletes or even high level college that enjoy coaching non professional or collegiate athletes well that's just a, isn't that just also to uh, like a financial decision because oh, couldn't could, the time you would make more money when teaching the general population oh really then okay. coaching professionals if you teach a lot yeah you teach a lot okay you know um if you teach two hours a day of course not but you you don't make that much money as a tennis coach okay Because you, ha I guess you'd have to be with a winner, right? Because then you get a percentage of the wins. I know. I'm really gonna like say some names, but like I know a coach who used to uh, train an athlete that was number one in the world at that time, and the coach was getting paid twenty five hundred dollars a week. Oh my God, right. that's almost nothing for at a professional level, and you're giving up your whole life and traveling constantly, and and you're of course there's some so like. You know, if Agassi or somebody or a former professional players coach, then they coach high-level players that have the potential or already at the very top and they see the benefit and they get paid a good amount, half a million, one million, 1.5 million, you know. But um, during my age, like that didn't exist. There were no former professional tennis players that used to teach current professionals. Right, that really became like I know Boris Becker coached, Ivan Lendo coached. Um, there were there were a few of them that coached along. Now that's pretty common at the very top, right? But in the in the nineties and the early two thousands, that was like hardly exist. Interesting. Yeah. And 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 why do you think that change was made? It's just these these, and it, it's almost all the male coaches, right? Like they just what they wanted mm -hmm. to stay close to the game, or they just wanted to keep an income, or they just missed the. I mean, did they really love coaching, or did they just miss being around tennis? I mean, you know, I think those coaches at that level, um, you love it. Tennis is your whole life. You're now making a lot of money. Back in the day, people weren't making that much money, so it's also lucrative. So you're doing what you love. You're good at it. You make a lot of money. It's like, well, you know. What else? Why would, you, why would you not do it? I think it's like a, it's a great avenue. I, I'm, I think it's great that former professional players are doing that now. It's funny, you know, I really think um, when you talk about money, um, I really think something changed when Federer started winning. Like, I really feel like Agassi, McEnroe, Sampras, the generation before Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic, like, they made great money, um, and they're all very, you know, wealthy, and they were all very high-quality athletes. They won all the big tournaments, et cetera, et cetera. But I really feel like I don't know, something happened when Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic came through for 20 years. They changed the amount of money that you could make. They changed the way partnership deals were done with, you know, sponsors. They they really changed everything, like with, with the way Nadal and Djokovic, or Nadal and Federer got in with Nike. And then even as 
as Federer went with Uniglo later on and cut his own deal and still has a partnership with Uniglo even now he's not playing tennis. Like, I just feel like the the corporate engagement also because of social media's explosion mm -hmm. completely changed in like the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. it, it was, and it never looked back. And now if you're a top, top player, I mean, Serena Williams is an absolute legend. And they say, um, you know, at her, at her peak, she was, she was making like 20, $30 million a year and Federer would make, you know, 50 to 60 to $70 million a year just in sponsorship. That's without even playing tennis. And that is just, I mean, that stuff wasn't even available in the, in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. And the sponsorship deals, I uh, I think it's great that they're getting it. I mean, those are, there's one, two every generation that really have that effect of like, if they're associated with a brand that a lot of people in the world like that brand because of that one person. That's true. Yeah. That level, you know, like Serena, Roger, and some other people. Mm. Um, but... Um, also, the money that is being made in tennis itself has increased so much. I mean, at some tournaments, they're winning like $3 million now. Which is three times what they used to make, or, or even four times. So, I mean, I remember there was a tournament. It, I don't even know what it was called. It was the first tournament. that you, They didn't even get ATP points for it. And it was the winner got a million. And everybody played it, of course. It was a, by invitation, top eight or top 16 back in the day. And everybody played it because it was such a ridiculous amount of money to win compared to any other tournament, Grand Slam, that everybody played that. Mm -hmm. Now that's a third of what you win in a Grand Slam. Yeah. So, but the players in the back, 200, 500 in the world, 1,000 in the world, nothing has changed at all. There's so much more money. So I feel like um, I would love to see, you know, that money that is available there to be just definitely the top in the pl players in the world should make a lot of money, mm -hmm. you know? The, um, people come to watch them. But you can take a good chunk of that and have the players that are, you know, from 200 to 1,500 um, at least, like, make a living off of it. Have some kind of, like, you know, living not wage. Like make a getting rich somebody who is 500 in the world or 800 in the world. But, like, I mean... They have costs that are astronomically high and they make nothing. Yeah, it must be so difficult. Yeah. If, if they would be making a thousand dollars a month profit, it would, it, it's impossible. Like nobody really? was, I don't know, everybody is just losing money. That's terrible. Okay. Oof, let's get back into it. So you moved to LA with your wife in yeah. 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. What did you end up doing? coaching so that was that was went pretty fast i went through my friend he had another friend uh here who was at a tennis club and um that guy was like yeah i'm going to introduce you to the director of tennis so i was like yeah i'm and he was like we don't need any coaches i was like yeah let's just meet and talk and he he knew kind of who you know what i've done who i had taught you know um and we, we just talked about it actually the other day, which is pretty funny. Um, and he wasn't expecting me to be open to just teaching whoever, right? He thought you only wanted to teach yeah, like elite athletes. You yeah. want here. And I was like, no, no, I'm like, I'm just teaching anybody. Like, no issue. So I walked there and he's like, can you like help out a little bit with the kids here? I was like, yeah, no problem. So I was teaching a couple of kids. And then... Um, the next day, he called me um, and was like, okay, so here, this is how you teach private lessons. This is how you can do this and do that. And I was like, okay. So totally unexpected. I was in LA for two weeks only by that time. Mm -hmm. um, and then because that, that's why I said it played in my favor, I was very fortunate that there's very few people that have taught at that level that I teach and then enjoy teaching people that are not ambitious professionals, um, everybody wanted lessons from me. Right, because you're the one that had coached all the professional exactly. players. Yeah. So within four weeks, I was teaching 50 hours a week, and I had a wait list of 40 people. Oh, my God. How many, how many, how many players, professional or non-professional, can you coach in a week? And out not professionals. No, sorry, amateurs. Like, yes. Yeah. 
how many people can you coach in a week? I know you're doing 50 hours a week, but how many, how many, how many people can you coach a week and actually help them improve their game? I mean, at that level, mm. everybody plays between one, maximum twi two lessons a week. I mean, lessons are expensive. Sure, right? yeah, of course, yeah. So private lessons, so people are not like five lessons a week or something and everybody's working, you know, I mean, it's a lot of people from the entertainment industry, so they have like whatever schedules, but... Mm. Um, have you ever have you ever coached any um, actors that needed to learn how to play tennis for a yeah, sport? Yes, yeah, yeah, for a tennis movie. For a tennis movie, yeah. Yes, yeah. it's called Breakpoint. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, a couple, uh, a lot of actors and musicians. I mean, it's LA, so yeah, everyone's here. <laughs> you know, everybody then who plays tennis, you know, there's uh, basically w some of those will find your way to you, of course. So. Um, yeah, I mean, you, like in any sport, at the very beginning when you start a sport, you don't need a lot of practice to improve a lot. No, it happens so quick. Exactly, <laughs> right? Yeah. So if you have never played tennis and now you start playing tennis once a week, you will improve crazy for one year. Absolutely, yeah. Right? And then, okay, now after a year... Maybe you need to start playing twice a week or and then three times a week. But that doesn't mean you need two, three, four lessons a week, right? Mm -hmm. But you need to start playing more. So that's what started happening. So I, I'm teaching everybody one, two lessons a week. I had maybe a couple of people that took two times two, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I had, I was teaching 50 hours, sometimes 60. But uh, clients, I had maybe like active, maybe 30. You know. And a 40-person waiting list. Yeah. Epic. So when did you when did you make this transition into focusing on mental coaching and training? Because it seems like you had a really great coaching life. Like, you loved it. And it's, it's actually very strange to hear you say how much you loved coaching people from all levels. Mm -hmm. I actually, um, when I was when I was playing university basketball, we would run a summer camp every year for kids and I absolutely loved coaching kids and again like if they brought the enthusiasm then I was like happy and enthusiastic mm -hmm. as well and I, it didn't matter whether they were like six years old or 14 years old or whatever and we were only like 20 um you know coaching kids like bringing them along like finding that enthusiasm um you know teaching them little tricks of mm -hmm. the of the trade it was mm -hmm. it was the best I, I loved coaching a lot mm -hmm. and maybe you know it would have been fun if I had coached a bit but I, I think about it from time to time but I'm just curious, like, when you moved away from that. So that was a very slow transition. So the mental aspect, like, for any coach, it started with, it's part of coaching, right? But not formally. But you're supporting them, you're motivating them, you're, you know, figuring out issues that they have. And then, um, really, right when I came here was the last... Uh, breaking point for me personally I had like a few instances in my life um, that led up to that already of like let's just call them kind of uh, pivotal points mm -hmm. you know for me mentally you yeah. know where like my life changed and my perspective changed so it wasn't like a breaking point but it was like a transition into something else uh, it was a, no. It was a breaking point in terms of mentally of like something that I believed to be true that wasn't true, and really kind of shattered my perspective on oh, so quite serious, uh, quite serious, yeah. yeah. Or a major insight that I had never had. I mean, like a new perspective that I have never thought of that totally transformed what I thought is possible and not. So I had those throughout my life sometimes, not because I had done anything, but I mean everybody has that. You know, to a degree. Sure, right? of course, yeah. Like, and just like an aha moment, mm -hmm. right? So like a v super powerful aha moment on steroids, right? I had like those two, three, four times. And then... Uh, can you can you tell me what happened? Is it, is it personal? I don't want to... Yeah, you know. um, so, yeah, I mean personal, but like I can talk. So the first one... It's just us. It's just us here. What? <laughs> <Good. laughs> uh, was when... Um, you're, the breakup with my first long-term relationship. In Marbella. In Marbella. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, resulted in my first uh, nervous breakdown. Okay. Mental breakdown. Like I had totally, I was hyperventilating and 
my hands started cramping and like I couldn't feel my face. Um, that's interesting. When you were playing tennis uh -huh. professionally, did you ever have anxiety attacks or anything like that? No, no. I mean, no, I would, not anxiety attacks. I would for sure be anxious sometimes that like I, my nervous system is uh, tending towards anxiety more and like not towards anger or sadness, mm -hmm. um, but not anything to a level of intensity where I would describe it as an attack on unmanageable. You know? Wow, that's intense, yeah. So that kind of like shattered my worldview because it was just, I believed we will stay together forever. There was no doubt in my mind ever that we will not be together forever. Yeah, that's what happens. And then <laughs> we weren't. Yeah. And when I had the realization, it was such, it was a belief only, right? But like it was such a strong held belief. Um, when that belief broke, I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. I could, there was not, it was like, I look at the sky and it's blue and all of a sudden I see, well, there's not the blue sky, that's water. You know, like, it's just like, what? The, the, the whole world was upside down. It's impossible, that cannot be. Yeah. Um, and that had resulted in me for the first time experiencing how powerful my mind was, just in a very unpleasant way. Sure. But I, all of the, this hyperventilation and the cramps in my hand was all based on my thoughts. So a thought would occur of something, I would see something in my mind, right? Remember something or, or, or visualize something that I was fantasizing about in the future that I had such a strong aversion towards, such a strong dislike, that my reaction towards that was of such intense aversion and that I would start to breathe heavy. And then the breathing would lead to cramping and so forth, right? Um, so that was one. And then, um, and then I had a friend that I met in Hawaii once and I uh, had like some conversations with him and he, uh, when I visited him, he led a life or and still leads a life that was so different than what from I was what I was taught that is a life that you can lead as a happy human being and healthy human being that I was like spent a week with him and I was like, what is happening here? Like I grew up more conservative, you know, sure. no, not religious, far right conservative, but like certain views also back in the 80s were now you would consider them very conservative right. back in the day maybe not so much and back in the day in germany yeah uh, and I, I i do i deal with a lot of germans yes. so you know just you, you have, if you grew up in the 80s in germany yes things were things were very yes yes it's straightforward for so i had certain you know that's how i grew up you know i mean like a lot of people so then i'm seeing this guy that i like super smart you made it uh, didn't have to work anymore at the age of 36 and had two young kids that were super healthy and um polite respectful and and they had an open relationship he had with his wife and they had a, a second person with them mm -hmm. uh, and he had another guy living with them that he was just helping out because he just was helping him yeah and they were smoking weed and I was like with them for a week and I was like, like, what can it be? How can like, you know, everything I was learned was like, well, if you take these kinds of drugs like that, you're going to basically become a, a heroin addict. You know, right. it was like a very extreme view. Yeah. And then I've got to get married, got to have kids. Um, you know, it was like heroin equaled a hero, uh, 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 smoking weed equaled heroin addiction, yeah. you know? And, um, there was no way that you could have an open relationship. Mm -hmm. Not that I function like that, but seeing somebody else being their true authentic self and being honest about it, never cheating, never n not mentioning it, mm -hmm. just being like, this is what I like. I found somebody else that liked that also. Mm -hmm. And we are happy together. And that's how we live our life. And I could see it. It wasn't like they're telling me. Mm -hmm. They never even talked about that stuff. I just like learned about it while I was there. I was like a, an, another worldview kind of like shattering yeah. for me, you know? Amazing. Um, and then when I came here, 
And, and then, I mean, that was not a worldview shattering, but I, what I explained to you in terms of like realizing that was pretty like a key insight for me um, because me as a player, I always believed that when I wasn't playing well, it was that had nothing to do with my mind and how I was feeling. That was like my physical skill. Mm -hmm. And when I was starting to coach all these players and also the very successful ones, I started to realize that it's not their physical skills. It's how they deal with unpleasant emotions, with distractions, what they pay attention to, and so forth, wh whether they realize whether they are paying attention or not. And when I had that realization, there was also like a major kind of um, perspective shift in my life. Amazing. Um, and then I was here 13 years ago, roughly, and, uh, you know, I, I was coaching in the club uh, and everything was going very well. And there was another person in that club and they um, didn't like the way I, at the volume that I was speaking and the way I was speaking with the people that I was coaching. Mm -hmm. So while I was coaching, you know. That seems like a very specific thing to have a have a opinion about. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit too much. Yes, yeah. But then uh, that person wrote a uh, letter to every employee in the club, um, except me. Oh wow! Telling everybody that they can tell me or that they should tell me to basically keep keep it quiet. How do you coach without and being loud? And the, one of the employees showed me that letter is like if I know about this letter and I was like, what letter? Mm -hmm. And then I read the letter and I, like I was saying, I like, I don't have a, a nervous system that is like leaning towards anger or sadness. Luckily, if I get angry, mm -hmm. then I get very angry. And I got so upset, mm -hmm. such an, uh, a strong release of adrenaline. <laughs> I couldn't even, I couldn't even function. I couldn't think about anything else anymore. Um, so I was. Um, Were you able to coach yourself down from the no. from the edge? Because you, I was coaching every every person that I was coaching. Mm -hmm. The only thing I was talking about was this. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't even. I, it was it, and it was so ridiculous. And everybody was also like, "How is that possible?" Like it yeah. was just like the most. Uh, uh, disrespectful like it's not a big deal in like you know when you take other things into consideration but like in this little scenario mm -hmm. in the in the in the work environment it was just like completely created it's just too much it was like everybody was like what and i basically also went to like the owners of the club i was like either that person is going to leave the club mm -hmm. apologize to me or i'm gone the ultimatum week i'm gone mm. Um, and then that happened and they apologized to me and everything. But in the meantime, anyway, I was so upset um, that after like uh, two weeks, basically, my wife was like, like, I get it. It's like ridiculous. But like, you know, you got to calm down like at some point. You got to let it go. Like you, yeah, you, exactly. Yeah. I just like I can't like I, there was nothing that I could talk about. So uh, I had this one client that for whatever reason yeah. everything that i would tell her everything that every explanation i would give her was a metaphor and i normally don't do that very much at all like sometimes you know when it comes up but with that one person everything was a metaphor every single time for whatever reason and she got it perfectly every time it's like the female ted lasso it was incredible it was insane so but then this uh, incident happened and then she started telling me a, a story a metaphor and that metaphor was as if it was like made for me I was like this I can't even like believe it. Like, can you share it with me can you do you remember it yes. so uh, the metaphor was um, so the duck with a human mind it's called have you heard that no I've never heard this one so uh, it's uh, not German or something like, like that. Uh, it is from a German guy that uh, wrote it. For, you probably know him also. Mm. So um, there's two ducks in a pond and um, the duck had a human mind and one of the duck swims, ducks swims into the territory of the other duck 
then what would happen um, they would kind of fight right um, and then they would swim apart but if the one of the ducks had a human mind it would be a start like how can that person how can the other duck do this who do they think that they are don't they know who i am they know exactly what this means if they swim into this territory like what is this going to what is going to happen now are they going to do it again i'm going to show them who i am right and <laughs> just telling me that I'm loving this i'm loving this it's yeah. like this is exactly what's been happening for me for two weeks i've been not thinking in, internally in my head there was no other thought for two weeks straight other than exactly what i was basically repeating right now mm -hmm. just with this other person that was my thought strain right so like this is incredible right um and then a week later she gave me uh another quote that that i forget uh i forgot and um and then she said, you know, those quotes, I thought those quotes are from her, right? Just like uh, metaphors. Mm. And she was like, you know, those are like from a book that I read. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what book? Give me the name Give of this book. The, <laughs> I need the book right <laughs> on the lesson. I'm like on my, we had iPhones already 13 years ago, right? Okay. So, um, like I buy the book and I, you know, I mean, my English was good, but um, certain, I didn't have a certain vocabulary. So this was like a... Um, self-realization book a lot of uh, philosophical stuff yes yeah. so like I was starting to reading it in English and I wasn't like getting it to the degree that I would be happy with mm. so I go home tell my wife the story and we had just moved you know basically a couple of months before from, from Germany we had like nothing in our little bungalow um, five books or something literally and I'm telling her this, and she's like, what? I was like, guys, Eckhart Tolle? Uh, we have that book. And I'm like, what? That was one of your five? Yeah. And which I didn't know that we had. So I didn't know who that guy was. <laughs> I had never to do anything with meditation or mindfulness or something. I just thought that's all like BS. Mm. Um, so she's like, here's the book. It's going to be. Can I be like this is one book? It's like that book that we have at home in German. In German, so you can that read. Brought from Germany yeah. that she had never read. She had gotten it from someone. <laughs> I was like, what? So you, were you like, we're gonna read this together now? I was like, I'm reading this right now. And yeah. I sat down, started reading it, and started reading it. And uh, you know Eckhart Tolle? I, I've I've heard of him, but yeah, yeah, but I haven't so gone through. The New Earth. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I started reading it and I started getting a little bit upset actually first, like the first twice. For if, I mean, even in German, the first couple of pages, I was just like, okay. and then after maybe 10, 15 more pages, I started getting a little bit upset. Yeah. Why didn't I get this book when I was 16? No, I was like how he was like talking about how the mind works and like how, what we do. And then he was like, we're all uh, schizophrenic basically. Mm -hmm. And like when I read that, it was like, what are you talking about? I'm like schizophrenic, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, I read a few more pages and the I had such a mind-bending moment that my whole life changed. Really? That moment. It was the With this book? Yes. And like page, whatever, 50 it was or something. No event in my life has ever had a more powerful impact and created a shift in my life than that moment reading that book. And I'm saying that with uh, the perspective that meeting my wife and spending the time with my wife in my life is the greatest gift I've ever gotten. I have wonderful parents. I've like my life has been, you know, ups and downs, but very good. Everything great. A lot of shifts, but everything pales in comparison to that moment. And what what was it about the teachings in this book that, that just changed you? So what happened in that book, and that happens, uh, this moment that happened to me, that happens to people, it's not like that one, one in a ten happens, but like it's also not like only two people in the world have experienced this. Yeah. Now it happens on social media. <laughs> This person's terrible. <laughs> Everyone should agree with me. 
Um, uh, yeah. um, no one, no one writes letters anymore. Actually, the fact that this fucking person wrote a letter goes to show you how old school they are and <laughs> how, and how spiteful they were. <laughs> yeah, I actually started practicing writing again. <laughs> um, so, um, what happened was that uh, in that moment, uh, I realized that um, I am not the same thing as my thoughts. Okay, that's great. Yeah, yeah that's powerful. So I, I was, un until that moment, I was fully identified with my thinking mind. And I have never heard anyone talk about any subject matter that would even touch upon something that would be different. Um, nor have I ever had the slightest realization that the one that is aware of the thoughts and the thoughts that those are two entities. Two totally different, and yeah. Something inside of us that, if it is inside of us, that is aware of any sense experience and then there is the sense experience. So there is something that is aware of the thought and then so there's a listener and then there is the thought and hearing the thought or there's a watcher and then, then there is the visual thought. Mm. So that moment, uh, that is not too uncommon. I mean, people, when have, they have that realization, can be a pretty major insight for the first time they have it already. Absolutely. It's not life-shattering insight. No. But like, whoa, that's true, actually. Kind of like a what? Like maybe some people that are listening right now, if they have never had that realization, and now they're just like sitting down and like maybe in their mind they're thinking right now, wait, like I can listen to my thoughts and there's a thought and I'm listening, so there's two. That could, and they have never had that realization. That can be a pretty major realization. Or yeah, uh, for sure. Like to have a thought, to listen to it, and then to act on it. Mm -hmm. Like those are all three different people yeah. in your brain. Yeah. Like we're totally yeah. schizophrenic, I feel like, yeah. you know, but you can have thoughts and not act on them and you can have thoughts and choose to ignore them. Yeah. Like, and, and it doesn't all have to be mm -hmm. what comes out. I mean, if, if you can, uh, if you can or cannot is another subject matter. Of course. But, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but when that happens, that doesn't normally lead to a disidentification with the thoughts. Mm -hmm. So you realize that you aren't a thought, but there's still a strong identification with it. You okay. just realize there's two now. What happened in my case was that I fully disassociated with any experience that can be perceived of any kind. Any visual experience, any auditory experience, any somatic experience, whether it's external, things that I could see, hear, and feel, or, or my thoughts, or my emotions, or, or my breath, anything, I was fully disassociated with it. And instead, I was fully identified with the awareness that is aware, that is perceiving these either activities or restful states in any of your sense categories. Um, and that had such a strong kind of cascading effect that my whole life shifted. Everything Horrible. changed. And I had so many uh, following uh, insights that follow out, followed up because once you disassociate with your thoughts and your feelings, but you're aware of them, right? And you start to experience how a th an emotion or a feeling uh, or a thought emerges. You witness it in real time emerging. You witness how a thought triggers a feeling and then the feeling triggers the desire to act or not act what you just said. Yeah. And how most people aren't aware of that. So every time you're unaware, you are basically just a slave. You're like a robot. Yeah, just a slave, a slave to the thing that happens to you. Yeah. So, I mean, not even a slave. A slave, I would say, in that case, would be like, you're aware, but you can't help it. And a robot would be like, you're not even aware of it. You know, like, uh, I'm just like, I'm thirsty and I lift and I drink. But like, I wasn't aware of the desire to drink. I wasn't, uh, I didn't become aware of the instance thirst arose 
Mm -hmm. And then that leading to the desire to move my arm. Mm -hmm. And that resulted in a cascade of insights of just how a human functions, like at the core. You went deep. But it was it was crazy. So not to extend, but the, this normally if people have that, that lasts just a brief moment. People can have it on um psychedelic experiences, mm -hmm. right? Um also. But and people have it when you meditate a lot. And the more you meditate, the more likely you will have insights like that and experiences. Um, and uh, the more you have meditated, the more likely this experience is not going to fade away right away or you can kind of integrate it into your life because if you don't have any, you don't can't put it into a framework and into any context and integrate it into life, it can also cause issues uh, for people. It also happens sometimes. Um, it's just the skills of taking all these things coming at you and putting them in the right boxes almost like what to act on, what not to act on, what to ignore, what to forget yes. about. Yeah. Y yes. And like it could, it can lead to also like, yeah, if like you're not, if you're disassociating with everything, then it could lead to, if there's not an experience of joy that comes with that mm. and, uh, reduce, uh, a reduction in suffering then um and not an increase in fulfillment then you could be like in a kind of challenging territory person depression yeah, yeah for sure so well i mean the depression is challenging but in that case it's a little different because depression is a experience in your senses and mm -hmm. the feeling or thoughts in combination but you're not associated with them so the depression is not the issue in a, in a state like that mm. because you're you are not depressed. There might be depression, but I'm not the one who is depressed. There's just a depression happening. Right. And that's not it, it, it doesn't become you. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Nonetheless, uh, if there's not any love, any compassion, any joy that comes with an experience like that, generally it's pretty unpleasant for some time, but, but that's very, very rare. That's very rare. Um, so... But in my case, this disassociation with my senses and the ability to track that in real time the whole time, to be aware all the time, lasted for like two months. And of course, I started reading Eckhart Tolle, watching up and down. Like I'm very, like, I'm not interested in a lot of things, but when I become interested in something, then I like kind of go deep dive that's so that's what happened with me then with meditation and mindfulness and the mind and basically like the human experience did you go back to the country club and find the guy who wrote the letter and tell him <laughs> thank you because it because it afforded you to take a deep dive into your own mind not done that did no i should do that i mean i should it, it was a shitty thing to do but he set you on a whole different uh, path yes he did yeah. yes he did you're 100 percent correct you're yeah. actually so um if not we can go later and throw eggs at his house do you know where he lives I haven't done that since I was a teenager. <laughs> I've never done. It was big on it was big on Halloween. Oh, really? sometimes yeah, every now and then we got into some trouble. Now we'll get canceled. <laughs> now we'll get canceled. Yeah, in the eighties, I threw eggs at someone's house. Yeah. Um, okay, so so this, but this this is interesting because then this sets you off into a whole new mm -hmm. um, coaching direction. Well, so now it's like you have this understanding and skill, this experience. But I have no coaching experience. Now, to be able to explain that to somebody and put that in a methodology and a framework, and most people don't have these experiences and you need, and, and this field is very broad. It was a very deep, meaningful, significant insight, but nonetheless, it's not the whole story either. It continue. It goes much deeper when you really dive deep. Yeah. Um, I think you all, I just, sorry to interrupt. I think you almost need to have some really shitty negative experience in order to get it, to benefit the most out of that learning. Like, and most, yeah. And maybe most people just haven't had someone treat them that terrible publicly for, the, for them to be able to really grasp that lesson that you learned. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's, I mean, it doesn't need to be 
It doesn't need to be another person that is doing that to you. It could be anything that causes you to just suffer deeply. Society. It could be any. It could be anything. Yeah. Literally, right? Your your own mind, right, is really doing it. Not every day. <laughs> um, so, um, mm. but either what will happen is something that what happens to me, or it will break you, if it's like really hard, you know. And most people are experiencing something that's hard, but never that hard that they are basically on this fork where either it's going to break you or you're liberated. Wow. That's you know? powerful. Yeah. So once I had that experience and, and, and it was not like an instance, but like a continuum, uh, I also understood that I didn't have any intellectual understanding about it but ex experiential and then i started taking meditation courses and mindfulness courses and then i was sitting there in like these groups and with teachers and that what they were saying i was like that is so like obvious i didn't like that it didn't hit me and like i didn't understand like that is so simple what are you talking about now because i didn't realize that the experience that i had was kind of so rare that people that are meditating for years and years never even had like the slightest glimpse of that um, so then I, and very importantly, because I had also not meditated or, or in other words, I had never done anything to, um, in a consistent way, develop my mental skin uh, skills, um, the, this experience faded away and I, and, and it be, turned into a memory and I started to be identified with my thoughts. And I started to be unaware. So you lost it again. To be erect, reactive, yes. And I totally started to fall back into like my old me. Mm. And I was like, that cannot be. Never will I go back into that, whatever that was in my life before. Even though I was a happy human guy, like no issue at large, yeah. but that was such a big shift. Um, it's almost like you were living unaware and then all of a sudden yes. the whole world became yes. clear in yes. like one minute. It, it's li literally like you're watching a movie and you think the movie is your life. And then you realize like, oh wait, I, the movie is not my life. This is just like a small person. I can go out and I can do all these trillion things. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you go back in the movie and you can't leave the movie. But you know the it's out there, but you can't access it anymore. So then... I was like, that's it. Like, I am going all in. So I started every teacher, every... I, ha I had the big fortune that once you have an experience like this and you listen to teachers, you very quickly can discern whether somebody knows what they're talking about mm -hmm. and have had the experience or somebody is just, like, faking it. Sure, the, bu the bullshit meter gets very... Uh, very own yeah. like, pretty clear cut. Yeah. Um, and also a lot of teachers that know what they're talking about for people in the earlier stages and on this journey, they feel like they're contradicting each other. But like once you understand, you understand like they're not contradicting each other. They're talking about it from a different angle or a different aspect of the entire kind of, you know, journey. Fascinating. So I went in and I was just like, that's all I did. And I practiced for myself, not to teach. I had no interest in teaching. And were you still coaching tennis? I was coaching tennis all the time. Yeah. And I was just, and I was coaching tennis and I was developing my mind. And so that's the best way to put it. So either you're practicing or you're reading about it or you're talking about it. I, I did nothing other than playing tennis and that. And after, you know, I don't know, maybe three years, four years or something, my mental skills, my ability to pay attention to what I wanted to pay attention to, my ability to be aware and not lost in thought or in experiences, and my ability to not have such a fighting relationship with experiences, whether something was unpleasant and like not suppressing or trying to avoid it, or whether I liked something and not clinging to it so much, mm -hmm. had uh, improved to a degree where I was like, well, that's very different now and that was the moment when i was like i want to teach that that is so much more powerful and impactful for people 
than teaching tennis. Uh, but I already was combining it with tennis the whole time, integrating it into tennis. And there are so many people in the world that are so good in helping people with this, with these insights and teaching it um, in, uh, for people that are suffering that I didn't feel the need nor the desire to teach people that are just suffering. Not just because it's not, not a big deal, but that's their issue. I wanted to teach people that wanted to improve their performance using these skills. Interesting. So, yeah, because you didn't, because there's very few people that do that. Right. You're a small, you're very a small group. Um, and funnily enough, um, most athletes, all athletes, are using and developing these skills that you develop through mindfulness in a consistent way, but not in a methodology. They're not using a methodology. Right. They're just picking up bits and pieces along. Well, they're just like, you have to watch the ball. So you're developing your ability to watch the ball. Mm. And that's getting better because you're watching the ball all day long. But you never really realize like, oh, wait, if my attention moves away, I need to move my attention back. And it could be visual, but I could be watching the ball, but like my attention is really on what I'm thinking about, right? While I'm watching it. So I can be moving my attention without moving my eyes, obviously. So um, that's kind of what I focused on. And yeah. that's, that's wild. Um, it's almost kind of like when you say like focusing on attention and stuff like that, it's almost like living in the moment. Like it's, it's almost like not focusing on the before or the after, but just kind of living completely in the moment as well. Well, um, so living, being in the moment is basically the other skill. Mm -hmm. That's awareness, presence, um, or just your tracking, your experience in real time. Mm -hmm. Because even if you are thinking about the future or the past, you are still doing that in this moment. But you should be watching you the ball. Can, uh, yes. Mm. But, so, uh, there's different kind of like aspects to this. So, the reality is that you can never not be in the moment. It's impossible. Everything is just in this very moment, including your thoughts. Even a thought about the future is right now. You can't be having a thought about the future in, in the future right now. You, That's not, it hasn't happened yet. Okay. Right? Yeah. But when people um, generally refer to you living in the future or you're living in the past, that means that they are thinking about the future and the past and they are not realizing it. They are unaware. Mm -hmm. That's the key, key issue. So the issue is not that they are thinking about it. The issue is that they are unaware that they are thinking about it. So in order to enter the present moment, you don't have to stop thinking about the future. You just need to start to be aware that you are thinking about the future. Interesting. And if right now I think about how I'm going to exit the store in whenever that is in the future, but I'm, I am aware that I'm that's happening right now. So I'm, I'm not lost in the future right now. Mm -hmm. It could be a fantasy. It could be a future thought, a, a past thought, a memory, or whatever it is, right? Interesting. And and so when you decided to teach this to people who wanted to perform better, who who was who was the target audience for you? Any athlete. Any athlete. Any athlete that wants that basically uh, sees the opportunity in developing their mental skills in order to enhance their performance, which is everyone. Exactly. But the but not everyone is motivated to do that. Sure. Okay. So I'm definitely not trying to convince anybody or uh, or try to explain to people like why they really need to do it. It's like these are the effects. Because we have a lot of science that backs everything up. But if you're not interested in doing it, that's not even your fault. You're not choosing what you're motivated to do and what not, right? So. Only once the motivation arises, and anything could arise, could, could cause that, um, only then is it the right moment for you to start. 
Amazing. And if you understand right now that it's beneficial for you, but you're not motivated, you're not going to do it, and it's nobody's business to try to do anything else. It's the same like coaching. They have to come to you with the enthusiasm or else yes. it doesn't work. Yes, exactly. Oh. Okay, so back to the timeline. Mm -hmm. So how long ago was it when you read the book that that unlocked this? Yeah, like when I came here, like 2011. And then, and then when, how much longer after that did you coach tennis for? So I still teach some people sometimes now a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I have some, like I have a boy now that's going to college. I've been teaching him for 12 years. Oh, wow. For example. Um, but I basically stopped coaching like as my main thing when I started working for Adidas, which was in 20... 19. Okay, so what? So how did that? How did the Adidas partnership work? I, how did it come together? Because this yeah. is something we haven't touched on yet. So um, what happened was I started to heavily integrate mindfulness into coaching tennis. Okay, and and I already had you know I went to UCLA for it and I did like all my kind of programs and certifications so you kind of have that and you learn a good amount and everything right. Um, so that had happened kind of before that. So there's like degrees and certificates yeah. about mindfulness and stuff like that, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then, um, and then I had started working with my partner, one of my partners, Juliana, on creating an online um, program for people to be able to develop these skills specifically for athletic performance. Okay, interesting. Um, in order, my goal was back then, it was to basically also be, a, because it's expensive, like if you take a session from me, it's very expensive. And um, with tennis, I was kind of okay with that. And teaching these mental skills, I'm also okay with it if you have the money, but I didn't want it to be available only to people that have money. Sure, because people, every, everyone from every walk of life needs this. Kind of a different ballpark. Yeah. So the online platform was really meant to, yes, of course, you can reach more people also, mm -hmm. um, but um, it was really also for people that, first of all, can't afford like my hourly rate. And then it's also available for people that can't afford anything. Anybody is um, able to just write us an email uh, so explain why they can't afford it and then they will get the program for free. Amazing. So You're really giving back to the community. Yes. Yeah. Like, But you have to make it. It's not like yeah, you log in and you get it for free. It has to be like you have to be interested. You know, just like the way when you pay, you're interested in doing it and you will do all the work and then when people get it for free, they sometimes they feel like they need to put in less work and they get it for free. So no, like you will get it for free but it has to make sense and you really need to want it. It's the value proposition. Yeah. They have to value what they're getting back. Yeah, I get it. So um, so then I went to Italy to a wedding of a, a friend of mine where I didn't want to go, not because I didn't want to go to the wedding, but I didn't want to go to Italy for a wedding. Weddings are tough. Yeah. Weddings are tough. Uh, but my wife was like, "You, we are going to this wedding no matter what. Mm. Okay. And we went there and it was also the most amazing wedding. It was a week-long wedding. The, basically, everyone went to this little castle in Italy like um and in Tuscany hundred yes a yeah. hundred people and everybody was together for one week and most people knew each other very well and it was everybody was like the same age range everybody was like you know what are 35 to 50 or something like that and that's personally my nightmare I'd rather just be on a mountain by myself in a tent <laughs> no I, that's what I was thinking but it was incredible that's great because it was all people with similar interests, um, maybe starting a family, successful in what they do, creatives, athletes, coaches. Like, it was an amazing group of people. Really. Sounds like good networking, actually. It was well, really. It was so much fun. Um, and, and most knew each other for a long time. It was like a, not like you're starting to network. It's like I was one of the very few that didn't know most people. And even I knew probably like 15 people there. One of the guys that I met there 
um, also loved uh, mindfulness and was fully into it and he loved Ram Das and this and that. And he had just started this project called Adidas Runners um, where they uh, basically wanted to make running and coaching um, in a holistic way accessible to people across the world in major cities for free. Um, which, of course, then, you know, had a marketing play into when people like uh, this Adidas running community and they really benefit in their lives and they get healthier and fitter, um, then they will associate that with a brand and therefore that's of big benefit to the brand. So I understand, yeah. Um, so they had th this uh, community um, and program was based on a few pillars, which was um, performance, strength, recovery and mindset and they had all of these pillars figured out and what to do and how to do it except mindset and then you just happened to meet this they guy couldn't they didn't like they met with like uh, some people and that was like too military and then there was with other people that was like too spiritual and it's like it wasn't like athletic and like it didn't make sense they couldn't uh, translate it like so they were struggling with that so I was telling him what I'm doing, like what kind of what I'm telling you right now. Um, and so we got a little bit into the depths and the methodology and how you can develop these skills and what these skills are good for and more based on examples for athletic performance and this and that. And what the methodology and framework would look like for somebody to develop this, to actually train it right? rather than just have talks about it. Um, and he was like loving it. And then they were like thinking about opening up a community in LA. So like the he the global head and him and a few other people came in and we had dinner together um, and I was explaining everything to them again and they were like, yeah, this is great, let's come up. We have like a, a global meeting um, in February, uh, which was like, in yeah, that was in 2018 we were meeting. So in 2019, early, no, 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 no. That was early 2018. So 20, sometime in 2018, I flew to New York and presented to like the global head of marketing and this and that, like how mindset for Adidas could be integrated and what mindset would mean um, and what people would do and how it could be taught, right? And where the benefits would be. And then I became the uh, mindset coach for Adidas here in Los Angeles, Adidas runners. Um, and then I became the global mindset coach for Adidas runners where, so here I was basically teaching the community on a weekly basis, twice a week, you know, with community members in groups or even one-on-one -on -one sessions, teaching them how to use these skills, develop these skills. And, and in my global role, I was um, in charge of developing the framework of how what I do, other people could start to do in other communities because we had like over, now there's like over 70 communities around the world. Um, so when somebody in Bangkok and in London and in Frankfurt and in Buenos Aires is talking about mindset that there are not, people are not talking about different things. Mm -hmm. So it's your job to keep them all on the same page. Yeah. So I, I developed the framework so they could learn what it is, what they need to do, how to do it. Right. Um, and then I was traveling a little bit for them also. Um, yeah. So I was doing that and now, now very little. By now, but until last year, basically, I was doing that quite a lot. Okay. And did you ever start um, coaching any like professional athletes about mindfulness directly, or was most of your work just with Adidas? Um, so Mike Bryan, mm -hmm. I, when I went with him to the uh, World Championships, that was as his mindset coach, not as his tennis coach, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a, a UFC, UFC fighter. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, FC Bayern Munich. Oh, uh, the team. The team, but the female team. Okay, yeah. And Mia, some, like, I mean, a bunch. Mm -hmm. And then I teach at USC. Uh, and now in the next semester, uh, so at USC, actually, I teach um, introduction to mindfulness, so that's not uh, limited to performance enhancement. But now for the next semester is planned, so I'm not going to... What? Fitwood, yeah. It might be plastic. <laughs> might be plastic, actually, yeah. <laughs>
um, uh, we're going to have, or I'm going to teach a course uh, that is going to be mindfulness for athletic performance enhancement at USC. That's yeah. very specific and yeah, perfect for you. Amazing. And and what are you what are you looking at for the future? Like what are you looking at moving forwards? So well, additionally, I also have a business. Uh, independent of mindfulness mm -hmm. so with uh, with a client of mine that I started teaching in tennis um, and then eventually he had an injury and then I uh, started teaching him in mindfulness for three years so once a week we had mindfulness sessions um, and he had a company he's from LA uh, sold his company um, and we were just like we liked each other we had a great relationship we we're like let's do something together mm -hmm. so we started coming up you know we first we wanted to create a fitness facility where mindfulness was fully integrated into any any workout interesting okay? that yeah. was like the initial idea what we started but then once we kind of started to create the business plan and the research this and that we were of the opinion that it's not far enough along like it, it, you couldn't scale this we wanted to create a business that's like scalable that you can have many locations of course yeah that's really amazing. so uh like we didn't believe and still to this day i don't believe um we at that point uh for many different reasons right? it, it feels like a real like a one-on-one -on -one experience like when you sit down with someone and they're gonna tell you how to be mindful uh, how to control your mind how to control your emotions it really does to me at least um, feel like a one-on-one -on -one experience. And then, of course, if that person that you're sharing that with or who's teaching you has those, like if I, if I was an athlete, I would definitely want to be trained in mindfulness by another athlete because they would know how to explain it in a way where I could benefit the most. I, that's just for me listening to you. Yeah. yeah, 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 it makes sense. I mean, it depends if it's like bi-directional or one-directional teaching. Um, you know, so there's a lot of mindfulness teaching going on in big groups and very effective also. Um, but of course, once you have conversations, especially deeper conversations, those need to be in very small groups or one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. But that's not always available to a lot of people because then it gets expensive. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You know? So, um, well, so we kept, kept iterating, iterating what we wanted to do. And like the basic idea was... We wanted to help people that were like in a similar situation that I was in. Like I was teaching a lot. I was charging a high rate, but I was kept. I couldn't teach more than 50 to 60 hours a week. It was impossible. Mm -hmm. And I was physically fatigued. And um, and I couldn't scale it also. Yeah, when you're coaching right. privately, you're, exactly. you're, you're, yeah, you're locked into what you can do. So, and there's a, um, so we looked at like the kind of like the fitness, wellness industry, sports industry. Um, and, you know, to cut this a little shorter, we basically honed in on um, fitness professionals um, and then honed in even further on independent physical therapists, athletic trainers, strength and conditioning specialists, and personal trainers that run their own business. And our business provides everything that they need in order to scale their business. Oh, interesting. So we have a, it starts with a facility. So we have a facility in West Hollywood that is for independent personal trainers, um, I would say the most advanced facility in the US. Incredible. The only other facilities that are like that or even better are in facilities where um, em only as an employee you can train people. So Exos is a company, for example that has incredible facilities, um, all the equipment that we have, or most of it, and then much more of it and much bigger. But you can't work in Exos if you're an independent physical therapist. You need to be employed by Exos. Mm -hmm. So if you're an employee, you're never making anywhere near the money that you would be making as a successful independent professional. So you built a facility for independents to come in, use your facility for a fee, and then be able to still run their own business with their own clients. That's really switched on, yeah. And so, the, But that's just the beginning. That's the first layer. Mm -hmm. So you have a facility with the best equipment that you don't have access anywhere else. What's this place called? Maverick. Okay, Maverick Community. Okay. Uh -huh. you got to pimp your own business, right? <laughs> um, then 
you all the uh, trainers and PTs don't have to pay any fixed rate. Um, you only pay per use. So you pay up front, but you basically you just pay hourly. And the lowest hourly fee that like we can afford. So basically, it's like uh, depending on the package you buy, it's twenty five dollars an hour that you pay. Seems reasonable. Yeah. yeah. And you only pay if you're making money. So you never you never never have any fixed costs that you have to carry if you're like making less money, let's say, right, for a month, or you're going on vacation, you get sick or something, and all of a sudden you have to pay your rent. It's not happening. No. Um, you obviously don't have to take care of anything that has to do with the facility, right? Um, and then we come in, my partner and me, as basically your advisor, partner, employee, coach, manager, agent, what any, whatever you need, wherever you are in your career at the moment is where we will support you if you want that support. It's like a independent fitness trainer incubator. Yes, exactly, mm. exactly. And and very cool. Physical therapist. So mm. now we have one uh, physical therapist. Her name is Lauren Clark, incredible physical therapist, one of the most uh, renowned PTs in town, um, runs her own business, um, but was by herself. Sure. If you're working 40, 50 hours a week, you're also like limited. You can't like do other things anymore, right? Um, and that's where a lot of the people kind of stagnate then. So now she's with us for nine months and she it's a team of seven people now. Amazing. That they have. You've helped her totally scale her entire business. So, um, you know, whether it's like helping them create a website or um, insurance or um, how to find people that work for you, whether they're independent contractors or what the pay scale needs to be, um, how you should structure your rates, right? depending on where you are in your career, like all of these things, we help with them. How to deal with clients, how to find clients, like some people are earlier, some people are very far into their career and very experienced, so you need more like a sounding board. You know, we bring them partnerships. We have amazing partnerships with Adidas, um, all of our trainers that come on board. Um, to, to come on board also because the community is so important and that you're like, it doesn't matter if you're like the most experienced and busy professional ever, but kind of what your values are and what your reputation is, is very important. So um, there's like an application process. And once you, once you, if you want in and you get accepted, then kind of the floodgates open for you. So everybody gets like a welcome package from Adidas, which is very, very generous package. Um, then they get um, uh, supplements from Momentus, okay. which are amazing. So we have a great partnership with them. Um, then there's another company called Found uh, that depending on kind of how busy they are and how much, you know, they're using the facility, like more and more partnerships open up for them. So we are like helping them in any way possible. We're just like, it's a very also one-on-one -on -one relationship. I'm like on text message with them, texting with everybody. Um, yeah, that's amazing because um, so many people who are great physical therapists or great personal trainers don't necessarily have like all the business acumen that they would need to be very financially successful, mm -hmm. even though they're very good at what they do, right? Yeah, because like you treat people or you train people, you don't have all the skills. Mm -hmm. right? That's like what it is. I mean, also with my partner and me, there's a lot of skills that I don't have that he has and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And just us teaming up um, allows us to provide a kind of service, you know, to those professionals that some of the skills they don't have. And we just like everybody kind of support each, uh, supports each other. Mm, that sounds yeah. amazing. Well, well done. That's exciting. That's like you're really giving back to your own community, actually, because you were a tennis coach for so long. It's yeah. uh, you're you're kind of really well positioned to be advising people in this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly going going down that route. Yeah, and they were they would respect you because you've been through it. And then we're incorporating mindfulness in there also, and we have workshops, you know, and then like we do a mindfulness workshop on how to integrate that into training and physical therapy and stuff like that and other workshops like it's it's really like it's an amazing group of people we have like over 30 uh professionals in now over a little bit over 20 of them are like in all the time and 10 15 of them are basically like coaches and pts that come from out of town sometimes working for a professional team or you know or maybe on retainer with uh, somebody mm -hmm. and then just when they're in la they need it uh, amazing that's a really good business model yeah yeah we think so Absolutely. Um, 
Okay, so so your your mindfulness training, what's that umbrella company? What what is that called? Mind size. Mind size. Mind size. Okay. Yeah, mind size sports. And wh- and where can we find that? On mindsizesports.com. Okay. Yeah, and then there's kind of two avenues. Either you do it as the athlete or as the person that wants to develop these skills for your athletic performance. Or there's also a teacher track where you want to learn to teach those skills. Yep. Sure. And then the and then the personal trainer, person uh, physical therapy stuff is Maverick. Yeah, the website is bmath.com. So like B Maverick, B E M A V dot com. Okay, that's great. And do you even have a personal website for yourself, or just these two I businesses? Do. I do. Just my last name Straka dot L A. Because you live in L A. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love Struggle. it. Struggle.com was not available. Yeah. Uh, that was gone a long time ago. So, uh, Amazing. So, I mean, like, I wish you the best of luck in everything you're doing. It's pretty wild. Is there anything else you want to chat about? Are you feeling good? All right. Yeah. Good. I feel amazing. It's a, Yeah, it's been a great conversation. I really, yeah. really Excellent. so glad you came by. Yeah. All right. So now we can go to this one and we say goodbye. Good to meet you, man. Thanks for coming by. Yeah. Amazing.